I've been a national park ranger for close to two decades. Protocols have changed a lot in that time. I write this just to try to keep people safe for the next time you venture to the big outdoors. Let me tell you about the last park I worked. I can't be too specific about the location for my job's sake. Anyway, we had clusters of campsites that we rotated annually. The idea was to prevent one group from getting overused and worn down, let nature regrow a bit. The winter had just passed, and our big summer season was a few months away. I'm sent out to check the suitability of the campsites to decide which ones need time to recover and which ones we can open up. Winters here are cold. Not too many people camp during the winter, aside from rugged masochists and Boy Scout troops led by people who believe they are rugged masochists. I didn't expect to find much out of the ordinary. The first site was clear and ready to go. As I'm trekking to the next site, I see what looks like some debris and junk down a ways in a river valley. Looks like some jackass set up an unauthorized camp down there. Usually, when that happens, they leave garbage and smoldering fires. This is going to be a pain to clear up. I approach, seeing the telltale wreckage of what must have been one hell of a party. Shit scattered everywhere, the skeletons of tents still raised up, and blood. I stop, and time stops with me. Pools of blood are spread out along the ground, next to signs of something heavy being dragged into the brush. I pull my radio off my belt and pause. I then pull my Glock 22 out of my holster and rack one round. I'm a certified law enforcement officer, but I haven't had to use my gun in a long time. I quickly look around for any movement, then get on my radio and call in for backup. While I wait, I listen. Silence. Silence in nature isn't good. Pray get quiet when they sense a predator. I hope all the birds are being still on my account. I edge forward slowly, looking for anyone or anything. A shredded plastic cooler, a tent that has been annihilated, with more blood splashed on the walls and inside. People died here. I know it. You can't lose that much blood and just walk off. But no people. Shreds of clothes and a little viscera drawing all the damn flies here but no people. I've seen bears rummage through camps and destroy anything that looked edible. There are wild hogs here that cut trails through the deep brush and are even more dangerous than the bears, but this isn't either of them. The devastation here, it's just too much. Some scourge of God came through here and just ripped everything to pieces. Finally, backup arrives, and I'm sent to report to HQ. They even brought medics out here. I don't know why. There's no one here to save. One of the new recruits vomits at the scene. I'm glad to get the hell out of here. I get back and HQ is a buzz. Only four people work here, but calls are ringing, printers printing, and the air feels electrified. The manager sees me and signals me to his office. He's pale, ashen looking with bloodshot eyes. I sit down by his desk, and he goes to the door and locks it. I've never seen him lock that door. He asks me what I saw. I tell him, uninterrupted. He looks even paler afterward, and his hands tremble a bit. There's a very long pause, and I expect more questions. He doesn't ask any. I leave, then hear the door lock behind me. After a few minutes, I hear him call someone up, and a long, low conversation ensues. I never see him again. Word comes down from on high. We're assigned a new manager, one who excels at what he calls crises. His first order of business, a controlled burn of the unauthorized camp and the sites closest to it. I'm not arguing. I watch the smoke rise in the distance and pray that's the end of it. New orders. Relocate the existing campsites closer to HQ. Before we do that, we take out a few trail cameras at the new locations, just to make sure it's not in the middle of a nesting ground. 
we put up a few cameras pointed at the hog trails through the brush for good measure. A couple days pass, and we go out to collect the footage. The new manager takes it all and starts studying it in his office. A couple hours into reviewing, he freaks out, starts screaming and yelling. He gets on the phone, calling up the line, spitting more obscenities. He spends the rest of the day and that night in the office, calling up specialists and planners. The next morning I show up for a meeting. The manager doesn't look like he slept. Massive changes of foot. He lays out new plans, including massively bright lampposts circling the park border, as well as floodlights around the ranger station. Campsites need to be moved even closer in. Clear lines of sight from the light, if possible. I butt in, telling him that defeats the point of going camping. If you're just going on a short walk through the grass, then setting up so close you can see the parking lot. He tells me to shut up, that it's just the start. The park now closes at sundown, sharp. Also, we're now required to have a long gun on our person at all times. Now it isn't uncommon for rangers to carry an AR-15 or a Remington 870 shotgun going out in the deep woods. There are wild and rabid animals out there. The real concern are massive pot growers. These aren't your chill neighbor who hides a few plants behind the tomatoes. They run the spectrum from large-scale suppliers who like their privacy and dislike law enforcement to anti-government crazies who think we have no right over them. The true patriots. Both groups have a few common points. They tend to be well-armed, they do not like lawmen, and they won't shy away from taking a pot shot at some dumb poor ranger who finds himself in their fields. Keep in mind, Elliot Ness, Mr. I fought Al Capone in one, got scared off busting up Appalachian moonshiners because they constantly sniped at him in the foothills. They shoot to kill. Those are the reasons we keep the big guns around not routine patrols. I drew the short straw and got the overnight shift. The manager tells me more changes to protocol will be listed when I return. Overnights used to be easy. Monitor the radio, bust up the parties if needed, check for poachers if they're operating nearby, make sure the forest doesn't burn down. I clock in and per instructions, go to the gun cage. My things have changed. Our shotguns have new rifle barrels so they can handle the solid slugs we've been issued. That's the kind of firepower you want to take down a charging bear. God forbid you ever need it. The AR-15s have been stepped up too. The old 15 round magazines have been replaced by 30 round ones. Someone even snuck us in hollow point rounds. It makes no damn sense. Shooting in the woods, you need full metal jacket ammo so the rounds don't go wild when they touch a twig. Hollow points just exist to do more tissue damage. This is ridiculous. This is overkill. We're not a war zone. We don't need this firepower. Next to the radio, there are new instructions. Now we're not allowed to directly respond to emergency calls. We can reply, figure out what the issue is, then we report to a new phone number I don't recognize. Time passes slowly tonight. I'm not even allowed to leave the building until sunup. A few uneventful nights pass. The new floodlights and lampposts are frying my eyes. It's so bright out there, a blind man could see. A week later, some kids roll into the lot. They grab their backpacks and start hiking up the ridge. I know what they're up to. No one has booked a campsite that night cheap young ones going on a camp that will be a raging party. I wait for the sun to go down, confirming they're not out for a day hike. I call my manager to report. He instructs me to call the new number. I report up to them now. A curt voice answers the phone. He asks my part, then pauses. He asks the issue. Bunch of kids on an unauthorized site. Do I go break it up? I can see their campfire out on the ridge right now. I say, No, do not leave the building. Do not attempt communication. That is all. Report if there are any developments. Right after daybreak, the manager writes up. It's real early. Have you seen them? Did they leave? He asks. 
No, the car's still there. Let him rest. They're probably all hungover, I reply. He curses, non-stop. He then goes inside to make a call. I'm outside looking up the ridge when he exits the station. One AR in his hand, another one strapped across his back, Glock on his hip. He marches single-handedly towards his car. I try to ask him what in God's name he's doing, but he isn't listening or responding. He takes a jerry can of gasoline from his car and marches up the ridge. I yell after him, to no reply. I consider following him, but that doesn't seem like a good idea. I go back inside and call the number. The same curt voice, the same direct questions. Yeah, the manager went up to that campsite, armed to the teeth and carrying gasoline. What the fuck do I do? Stay there. Do not interfere. Backup is inbound. Report if there are any developments. About the same time, I start to see smoke wafting off the ridge. Two vans ride into the lot at screaming speed. A dozen men, heavily armed and armored, exit quickly. I go out to check. Who are you guys? What's going on? I ask. The men are all lined up with that impeccable military precision. One of them, a commander I assume, exits the vehicle last. He says, which direction did he go? I mean he's up there. I point at the increasing smoke. The men fan out and start jogging up the ridge. I hear rifles cocking as they leave. I try to shout after them, but no response. I look at the vans they came in. Large, nondescript. They just say, DOI response team on the side. Half an hour later, they return, dragging the manager with them. He's bound in zip ties. He screams. I did what needed to be done. Trust me. It's worse than they thought. We can't stop this. Burn it all. They throw him in the back and sedate him. The commander approaches me. My neck hairs bristle in cold fear. I need to see the office. All computers and anything with a hard drive is coming with me. He mentioned videotapes. I need those too. I unlock the doors and they ransack the place. Everything gets taken. Printed reports from the last few years disappear into those vans. The videotapes get bagged up and held by the commander himself. He studies the gun cage. Cute. You're out of your league, he scoffs. Finally, they found everything they looked for. The commander tells me, call the number, tell them it's contained, you need a new supervisor. Also, don't talk about this to anyone. They leave, and just on cue, the fire brigade and a few news vans show up. The fire is contained, and the news reports say, rumors of missing campers are unsubstantiated at this time. Still, the rumors alone are enough to scare off this season's campers. The quick change-up of managers is chalked up to bureaucracy. The press dies down after a week or two. The new manager is very good at dealing with them. Thankfully, with no new campers and our now even shorter open hours, we can get more work done around here. Rebuilding the station took some time, and we just set up the new campsites. They're practically spitting distance from the station. Nothing dramatic happens for a few days. Then, on a whim, the manager tells us to set up some cameras around the station and the campsites. There's usually so much human activity around here, all you see are some raccoons. Maybe the rare hungry bear, but we humor him and set them all around. A couple days pass, we collect the footage. I play poker with one of the rookies while the manager watches hours of footage of an empty but brilliantly illuminated parking lot. Then he gets to the footage around the station. Screams come from the office. We barge in and he's stamping on the camera hard drives, gibbering things I can't understand along the lines of, told me it was clean, safe, no recent activity, bullshit here, I'm not gonna do it. He barks at us to leave. Later, he makes a call. The rookie goes up to the door and listens in. The rookie comes back reporting. Yeah, he's demanding a transfer. 
says they lied to him. Something about they didn't do their jobs properly. He's not prepared or equipped here. Then I just heard the phone click and some sobbing. Hours later, my manager exits the office. His shoulders are slumped, defeated. We cut our hours even further, practically open on weekends only. We'll have a full staff ready those days, but a skeleton crew the rest of the time. Campers are required to check in to one of the closest sites. No campsite, and they're told to leave. We're not authorized to leave the station after dark under any circumstances. In an emergency, do not call 911. Call the number and do exactly what they say. We draw straws for who gets overnight shifts. Why we need to stay overnight if we can't do anything is beyond me. I asked the manager about it, and he just said that standard protocol is to have someone on hand to report any irregularities overnight. I have to work my overnight shift. I keep my phone close, the number dialed in, ready if I need to call. It's a bad night. I just wind up pacing around with my shotgun, glancing into the bright floodlights, trying to see what's past them. I hear crickets, and it relaxes me. Prey is quiet when predators are around. It's a long night. The next night, my manager draws the short straw. He seems resigned. In the end, we all have to take a turn. He brings the brightest damn tactical flashlight I've ever seen. He says he brought it just because he's afraid of the dark. He isn't really. He's afraid of the things in the dark. I get a phone call at 3 a.m. It's him. Get over here now and bring guns, he demands. What? You have a damn arsenal, I responded. Now, I swear to God, I fucked up. Oh man, I think they're attracted to the light. I called that number, and all they said was backup would be here in the morning. Oh fuck, my manager says. I hear the piercing staccato of gunshots. A pause. More gunshots. Screaming. Scuffling. The line goes dead. I call the number. A new, terse voice answers. Look, I work at Jefferson Park. I just got off the phone with Bennett. I say, I just spoke with Bennett. What can you report? The voice replies. Something bad. It's serious. I heard gunshots. I told him. We will have backup there as soon as possible. Did he say anything else? He asked me. Yeah. He said he thought they were attracted to the light. It doesn't make sense to me. I told him. Interesting. Thank you for your report. The park is now closed. You will be reassigned. Goodbye. Click. Officially, the park was closed to be scheduled for a controlled burn. Let the old trees die and make room for new ones. There was nothing in the official report about what happened to the manager on duty. The public understanding was bureaucracies need to be shaken up on occasion. No one asked any more questions. I get transferred to a new park, halfway across the country. A change of scenery and beautiful. They've got some odd rules here too. Don't go far after dark. And don't carry a flashlight. I'm concerned about why. Why can't you use a flashlight at night when you need one? They won't tell me. Be safe everyone. Well, you really screwed up this time, didn't you? You found a gnarly deal on a beautiful home that almost seemed too good to be true, and you jumped at it. And now that you're all moved in, you've started to notice some anomalies. You know the type. The spooky anomalies of the supernatural persuasion. Bumps in the night, doors opening and closing by themselves, auditory hallucinations of voices and whispers. It's more common than you may think, but not everyone realizes the danger. These signs could be proof that some forsaken lost souls inhabit your property. 
Maybe the previous grandmother self-immolated in the attic. Maybe dear old dad went suddenly insane and repainted the house with the blood of his children. Or mom tried seducing demons in the basement. If this sounds even vaguely familiar to you, and you are looking to the good old internet for help, then you've come to the right place. You see, I have this friend, well, had this friend named Nathan. A couple months back, Nathan found a house for sale in southern Georgia. It was nestled along a remote stretch of woods just outside of Waycross. It was a historical area, an old colonial-style home just under 5,000 square feet, six bed and six bath, with white picket fences and a dozen acres. The quintessential American dream house by all accounts. The price was unbelievably low, but after Nathan contacted the real estate agent, he found that the price that he had seen listed was indeed the price that was being asked. For most people, I imagine this would have raised some pretty big red flags. But Nathan was an idiot. The confident type of idiot that believed machismo is substantial for conquering all of life's obstacles. I know it's not kind to speak ill of the dead like that, spoiler alert, but I'm just trying to give an accurate portrayal of the kind of person Nathan was. You know, the alpha male who hits on your girlfriend lives at the gym and probably finds too much pleasure to his own selfies. For people like Nathan, friend is really just another word for ego reinforcer. He was cocky and often let pride get the better of him. His wife, Janelle, was actually my ex-girlfriend from a while back. Bit of a skank, but practically a supermodel. They had two kids, Natalie and Mason, who were both spoiled brats. Again, I'm just trying to give an honest perspective of them in hopes that we may all learn something from what happened. You see, what happened to Nathan, which I'll get into later, was something which I believe could have been easily avoided if only he had followed a few simple instructions. After the funeral, I got to pondering on the matter and realized that what we all really need is a set of rules to follow if you believe your house is haunted. Let's begin. Rule number one. When looking to purchase or rent a house, always ask for the history. Odds are, if a house is being offered at way below market value, then there is a very good reason for it being that way. Nathan didn't do this and thought that the undermarket price was simply the universe handing him something he didn't really earn, as it often seemed to do. Nathan jumped at the offer, and within a few weeks, he and his family were approved to begin moving in. I volunteered to help them move in, and I'll be honest, the house was absolutely gorgeous. Things were great for them at first, but Nathan soon started noticing some odd occurrences. It started with this knocking sound that seemed to reverberate all over the home at odd hours. He said he could never seem to pinpoint where it was coming from, and it never seemed to originate from the same place twice. Eventually, he just chalked it up to the house settling, but that was just the beginning. Rule number two, trust your gut. Your home is the last place you should feel uncomfortable. If you get that inkling of discomfort in the back of your mind that never seems to fully dissipate, pay attention to it. It's probably your subconscious trying to warn you. Nathan tried ignoring these sounds, told his wife that it was just normal or the wind, and comforted his children when they felt scared. He had two dogs, Rusty and Sailor, both of them black labs, and both seemed to become very anxious after moving in. Nathan did his best to get medication to help the dogs relax, but it didn't seem to help much. That brings us to rule number three. Along with your gut, you should also trust your pets. Animals have instincts far greater than humans. It's been said that man is the only creature who will sense danger and still wander into it. Animals have a sense for the supernatural, dogs and cats in particular. If you find them growling at what appears to be nothing, or constantly staring into specific areas of the house, then pay attention to that. Odds are, they can see something you can't. 
Nathan told me that Rusty, the older of the two dogs, would pace the hall each night for hours. He said it was like he was standing guard over something. On more than one occasion, Rusty suddenly blurted into a ferocious bout of barking and snarling. Nathan would come out into the hall, but never found anything. He grew concerned for Rusty and took him to the vet, but the vet confirmed he was in good health. Meanwhile, Sailor, the younger dog, slept at the side of Mason's bed each and every night. The poor boy soon developed crippling nightmares that would torment him relentlessly, and Sailor seemed to sense it. Each time Mason would wake up screaming, Sailor would be there to try and comfort him. And that segues perfectly into our next rule. Rule number four. Beware the nightmares. Young children are similar to animals in the way that they seem more perceptive to things that adults are not. This one can be difficult because there are many root causes of nightmares. With things like anxiety, depression, and other mental illnesses, the telltale sign is whether your child suddenly develops them soon after entering the home. Poor Mason had absolutely horrific dreams, and night after night, he would be tormented by them. He often spoke of the blurry man that came to him while he slept and whispered terrible things. He even said that sometimes he would see the blurry man while he was awake, but never more than a quick glimpse and always in the shadows or outside in the woods. Nathan and his wife worried that perhaps Mason was schizophrenic, but multiple doctors confirmed this was not the case. They tried giving Mason sleeping pills, various supplements, and burned incense to help him sleep more peacefully. It worked for a while, until Natalie started having them too. Rule number five, try to determine what kind of spirit you're dealing with. If you see flashes of a small child running through the halls at night, or orbs spiraling in the air, then odds are your ethereal neighbor is rather benign. Some people even discover they rather enjoy life with a spectral roommate and find their antics to be rather interesting. Most believe that spirits who pass away before completing what their soul desired will become stuck in a sort of purgatory. Many are scared, confused, and angry. But some, primarily young children, seem to be almost jubilant at times. Most of these are unnerving, but altogether harmless. But then there's the other spirits. Rule number six, if you or any member of your family develop inexplicable bruises, cuts, or lesions, then do not take them lightly. This should be a massive red flag and is a very bad sign. If you feel as though you're being attacked as you sleep and wake up with unexplained scratches or wounds, then just get the hell out of the house honestly. A malevolent spirit capable of inflicting physical wounds is not something to be trifled with. Odds are it's a demon, and honestly, that is the best case scenario. There are other non-Abrahamic related entities that could be responsible as well. They are very rare, but if encountered, well, I'm afraid even my handy set of rules won't be enough to stop them. Natalie and Mason suffered multiple scratch marks, wounds, and even a few bruises that almost looked like bite marks. Nathan's wife Janelle was also subjected to these attacks. The children's teacher at school began to notice and became quite worried for their safety. Obviously their first thought was not paranormal, but rather that the children were being abused at home. Only when social services threatened to remove the children from his custody did Nathan finally agree to move them out of the house. Janelle and the kids moved in with her mother a couple hours away, and Nathan was left all alone with the dogs. Rule number seven, let people know what is going on. Yes, I know the thought of admitting to a close friend that you believe your house is haunted may be a daunting one, but it's usually better than the alternatives. The modern world rarely takes these claims seriously. We put ghosts in movies and video games, 
But when someone actually claims to see one, we aren't so quick to believe them. Technology and science have led us to believe we are safe. That is our folly, but it's also a topic for a different day. This is yet another rule that Nathan did not abide. The worse that things got for him and his family, the more secluded he became. On numerous occasions, he phoned the police saying that he believed someone had broken in, but they never found evidence of it. Eventually, they even put him on a blacklist and warned him that any further contact would result in legal trouble. Rather than tell his parents or brother or any of his friends what was going on, he retreated into himself. He became fidgety and paranoid, at times refusing to return phone calls and texts from his loved ones. He just broke contact, and things only got worse. Rule 8 and 9 sort of belong in the same category, although one is a little more extreme than the other. Rule number 8. If you suspect something is up, it doesn't hurt to perform a cleansing. Like I said earlier, the modern world has little time to entertain the notion of ghosts and the supernatural, but that shouldn't ward you off. If you're unsure about whether your home is haunted or not, then a routine cleansing can do wonders for you. I'm willing to bet there are mediums and priests in your town that can get the job done. Even if you can't find anyone local, you can always just go online and find instructions for yourself. It's not as effective that way, but it's better than nothing. Rule number nine. If you're really feeling as though you're in danger, get someone to perform an exorcism. It's the step that no one wants to take, but desperate times call for desperate measures. Priests and spiritual leaders are your go-to for these kinds of things. Even if you yourself are not religious, these people honestly do know how to help. There's some evidence that Nathan was attempting to do this, but it's unknown why exactly it didn't work out. Maybe he second-guessed himself, and thought he could handle it, or maybe his ego took control once again. Nathan had been collecting evidence for a while and had amassed quite a stash of clues. He had audio recordings which relayed banging on the walls and footsteps in the attic. He took multiple videos, but none of them really showed anything except for the last one. But by that point, it was too late. In his journal, he also wrote that he experienced items in the house levitating on several occasions. But sadly, he had no recorded proof of this. Rule number 10, the big one. Whatever you do, don't try to antagonize this spirit. This should really go without saying, but angrily challenging the spirit or daring it to manifest itself is a really bad idea. But as you may have guessed, Nathan and his unlimited stream of testosterone decided to do just that. He got really drunk one night and began ruminating on all that had been happening. Nathan was always a skeptic, but even he couldn't ignore the psychological impact on his family, whether it was imagined or not. He realized his relationship with his children and wife were being heavily strained, and his new house had become a place of hostility. This made Nathan very angry. So Nathan stood up and shouted at his empty house for the spirit to come forth and face him. He was met with only silence, and so he shouted again. Never once did the spirits answer his call. After a few more verbose challenges, he broke into a bout of laughter, probably believing himself to look ridiculous. Apparently not everyone who was watching felt the same though. Nathan managed to stumble into bed not long after and was out cold within a couple of minutes. Nathan had kept a security camera in his room in hopes of capturing proof. And that night, he found something. At around 2.13 a.m., Nathan is seen beginning to stir in his sleep in the security video. He grunts and speaks briefly but the words were unintelligible. Suddenly his eyes sprung wide open in the bed and began glancing around the room. Nathan appeared to be struggling, but his body didn't move. It was believed he was suffering an episode of sleep paralysis, 
which left him temporarily paralyzed. His eyes continued to dart rapidly around the room. Then something happened that no one who saw the video could explain. The bedroom door slowly rolled open, but the darkness of the hallway was all-consuming. Nathan's chest began frantically pumping up and down, and his eyes stretched wide open. Something was then seen moving in the hall. It could have been chalked up to a trick of the light at first, but then a hand was seen reaching through. It was gnarled and spindly, like the wretched malformed appendage from some abyssal denizen. The figure slowly sauntered through the doorway, its tall, dark silhouette nearly grazing the top of the doorframe. It had no definite features, appearing only as a hooded, humanoid individual. No eyes or face, just a shadow corporealized from Nathan's deepest nightmares. Poor Nathan was heard mumbling and whimpering frantically, but in his paralyzed state, he was unable to fight back or flee. He could do nothing but watch in absolute horror as the thing approached him. It stopped at the foot of his bed and just stared at him for about a minute. Nathan continued to hyperventilate and didn't appear to blink once during the entire ordeal. The thing then finally moved closer. It then leaned down only a couple inches away from his face and appeared to whisper something. It was too quiet for the mic on the camera to pick up, but needless to say, it did not make Nathan feel any better about the situation. Suddenly, the thing lashed out with its twisted hands, constricting like pythons around Nathan's throat. In his paralyzed state, he couldn't even struggle against his shrouded attacker. Within a minute, Nathan's chest stopped moving, and his eyes fell still. The entity retracted its hand, and just stared at him for about a minute. Then, as if taunting those who see the footage, it looked directly into the camera. It whispered something again, but again, it was too quiet to discern what it was. Then, as quickly as it had happened, it waltzed out of the room and vanished back into the darkness. Nathan was found by his wife Janelle a few days later, and she called the police. After an autopsy, Nathan was determined to have died via strangulation, much as what was shown in the video. Cops scoured the premises and found footsteps from the intruder. However, the footprints were soon matched to a pair of Nathan's own boots. The police, of course, were not so quick to believe that Nathan was simply killed by supernatural forces. They conducted interviews with neighbors, friends, and family members, but none of them seemed capable or motivated enough to have done it. There were no signs of breaking and entering, and nothing had been stolen from the home. They came to me and conducted an interview as well, but of course, that was a futile effort. I mean, sure, the fact that Janelle was my ex-girlfriend was reason to suspect me, but I quickly dissuaded their actions. Nathan was my friend, despite him not really being a good friend. What kind of friend bones your girlfriend behind your back anyways? I'm not bitter about it though, at least, not as far as the police are concerned. My alibis were solid, and that's good enough reason for them. This brings us to my final rule. Rule number 11. Make sure you exhaust all other options before coming to the conclusion that your house is in fact haunted. If only Nathan had taken a little more time to investigate his home and himself more thoroughly, then maybe he'd still be alive today. Maybe he would have found the mini wireless speakers hidden in his attic to play the sounds of knocking. Maybe he would have found the patches in his air ducts that leaked mild doses of hallucinogenic drugs into his home. Maybe he would have detected the dog whistle alarm that caused his dogs to react so strangely. If he bothered to check himself, he may have found trace amounts of succimethonium, a paralyzing toxin that once ingested will leave the person immobile yet conscious to all pain. It would have been difficult to find 
as even coroners do not normally test for the substance unless specifically requested. No matter how you really slice it, this entire ordeal really comes back to Nathan himself. If only he'd been a better person and not constantly demeaned his peers at every turn. If only he hadn't been so stubborn and proud. If only he hadn't gone behind my back and boned my ex-girlfriend, thus ruining our future and sending me into the spiraling depths of crippling depression, then maybe I would have helped him. So, you may be wondering, is this my confession? No, of course not. This is only my list of suggestions and rules for how things may have turned out differently for Nathan and his family. These are all hypothetical explanations and are in no way to be considered incriminating evidence to be used in court against me or anyone else for that matter. Besides, if this really was a confession, then that would make anyone who reads it an accessory to murder, and we certainly wouldn't want that. I hope you can understand that, and I do hope that we can trust each other in this regard. After all, I have really good software for tracing IPs, and Reddit makes it incredibly easy to access them. We wouldn't want your house to suddenly become haunted now, would we? This sure isn't as creepy as most stories, but just something I think about from time to time. For a bit of background, I grew up in a very emotionally and physically abusive home. I've never had anything but negativity spoken to me, and as a child, I believed it. My self-esteem was rock bottom, and I believed that I was no good, and that everyone hated me, as I was being told. I became a very shy, withdrawn person, who really made little effort with friendships. I held everyone at arm's length, but was desperate for any small scraps of positive attention. I found this positivity in a wonderful young couple who came into our church to be youth leaders. I was bullied terribly by the kids at my church and hated going until this couple came there. They were young, sweet, and kind, and they went out of their way to be especially nice to me. They arranged a picnic and hike at a close-by state park for one Saturday. I was around 11 at this point, and ordinarily, I wouldn't participate in these outings, but since they'd both be there, I was excited to go. We met at the church and all got on the bus. I heard a few whispered comments about why is she here and about my clothes. I ignored them and sat by myself in the back of the bus. We got there and I mostly hung out with the couple, Sean and Claire. We had a big cookout near the lake and afterwards we went for a hike. There were quite a few kids there, so Sean and Claire had their hands full on the hike, keeping everyone on the trail. I, of course, was in the rear of the line. The kids I was behind started making fun of me and telling me I was too lazy to make the hike, and no one wanted me there anyway. They ran ahead laughing. I slowed down till they got out of sight. I then sat on a rock and started crying. In a minute or two, I heard someone speak to me. I looked up, wiping my eyes, and there was a man standing by me. I hadn't heard anyone walk up the trail. I stood and he asked if I was okay. I nodded yes. He then told me I looked sad and asked me to talk to him. I opened up to him, told him why I was there, and that the other kids didn't like me or want me there. He asked my name, where I was from, how old I was, and me, being a dumb 11-year-old kid, told him. He was probably in his mid-twenties with blonde hair and was cute. I was thrilled he was being nice to me. He gave me a hug and said that he and I could hang out and that he'd take me back to my group once they came back down off the hike. He took my hand and told me we'd go hiking a trail he knew. I agreed. All of a sudden, I hear Sean yell my name and tell me to stop and to get away from that man. He came running up and got in between me and that guy, and he started asking him what he thinks he's doing. The guy just shrugged 
and started walking away through the trees, not on the trail. Sean asked me if I was okay or if the guy hurt me. I could tell Sean was very angry, so I teared up again because I thought I was in trouble. Sean squatted down in front of me and told me I wasn't in trouble, that I'd done nothing wrong. I told him we just talked a bit and he was going to show me another trail to hike. Sean nodded and told me we'd just catch up to the others. He pulled Claire to the side once we caught up and they talked quietly. She then motioned for me to come over to her. She put her arm around me and we sat on a rock, talked and laughed. She had me walk beside her on the way back down and sit with her on the bus. The two of them made the rest of the day nice for me. It took me years to realize what could have happened to me that day and why Sean was so angry. Obviously, once Sean and Claire got to the stopping point on the trail, which was a stream with a sliding rock, they realized I was missing and Sean came back down the trail looking for me. If he'd been a few seconds later, I would have gone with that man and God only knows what his plan was once he got me out of sight. My poor guardian angel did her job that day. I have no clue if they reported this encounter to the rangers or not. I hope they did. This is actually the first time I've told this story ever. I didn't tell anyone when I got home because I knew that either no one would care or more likely I'd get yelled at and berated for being stupid and accused of trying to sneak off with him. Starting at the age of about 9 to 10, I was being accused of fooling around with boys in my neighborhood, which I wasn't. But if I got caught riding bikes, playing on the school playground, or just sitting and talking with a boy, I was berated for hours as being a slut. So I was terrified for a while that someone would tell my parents that this happened. Anyway, thanks for all the sweet and kind comments. You folks are awesome. We've gone to visit my wife Sarah's family every summer since we got married four years ago. They live in a small town way up in the mountains. Her parents own a lot of land, so we would spend our time riding ATVs and hiking trails. A while back, I took a week off of work and we drove up to spend the time with Sarah's parents and siblings. It was a good time, and the week passed way too quick. Sunday rolled around, and we loaded up our shitty old sedan for the drive home. We left her parents' place in the afternoon, and it started winding our way down the mountain towards the highway when Sarah sighed. Great. Check it out. She handed me her phone. It showed that the highway was red with traffic, for something like 25 miles on the highway. Must have been an accident. I guess we'll be sitting in traffic for a while, Sarah said. I pulled to the side of the road and pulled out my own phone. I saw that there was a long winding road that cut through the mountains for nearly 50 miles, finally rejoining the highway after the traffic ended. I figured that going slow on an old windy road was better than sitting in stop and go traffic for five hours. Sarah was very against the decision. When I asked her why, she just told me she had a bad feeling about it. Still, somehow I convinced her that we'd be fine. So, instead of turning right and heading down towards the highway, we turned left and headed deeper into the mountains. The road turned to dirt pretty quick. Sarah jumped into the back seat so she could stretch out, and she recorded some of what we saw out the window. I was shocked at how deserted it was. We only passed one house over the entire hour, and not a single car. Sarah recorded some video of the drive. We'd been on the road for a little over an hour when we came around a hill. Up ahead, there was a single crashed car just off the road. I pulled off to the side of the road and got out to take a closer look. I grabbed my phone to call 911, but realized I had no signal, not even roaming. I proceeded to take a picture. I came around to the driver's side of the car, 
and saw that the driver's window was shattered with no sign of the driver anywhere. Sarah walked to the front of the car and put her hand on the hood. The engine's cold. That means it's been at least a couple hours since the crash, right? Are we the first ones on this road to drive by? She asked. I told her I didn't know, but that it could be with how few people we'd seen. Sarah pointed to the broken glass from the window. It seems like a lot of glass inside the car. If the driver busted it to get out, wouldn't it make sense that it would be out on the ground beside the car? She said. She was right. The inside of the car was littered with safety glass from the window. I looked closer and saw flecks of blood covering some surfaces too. Where is the driver though? I didn't like that. I told Sarah it was time to go and that we'd call somebody once we had cell signal. She agreed and we hopped back into my car. I turned the key in the ignition and heard the rapid clicking noise that meant my battery was dead. I popped my hood and saw that there was a bunch of corrosion built up on my battery terminal. I swore under my breath. What does that mean? Sarah asked. I told her that it meant that there wasn't a good connection between the battery and the motor and that the battery was probably dead. We could fix the corrosion, but we'd need a jump to get the car started again. I talked the problem over with Sarah. We were already dozens of miles from her parents' place and we had no signal. Based on the car wreck, it was likely we wouldn't see any more traffic for hours at best and days at worst. On top of all that, the sun was starting to get low in the sky. We needed to find someone with jumper cables. I remembered that we passed a house a few miles back on the road. I figured it'd be best if Sarah stayed with our car on the side of the road, so I started walking back up the road by myself. It took me a little more than an hour of walking before I saw the house again. The house had a strange architecture, with part of the top floor hanging over the lower floor. I saw there was a small garage in the woods behind the house. I walked up to the door and knocked, calling out as I did. There was no answer. I walked to a window next to the door and looked through. The inside was abandoned, but I saw that there was a message scrawled on the wall. I looked closer and could just barely make out the words. It said, they can't see you if you don't make noise. I read it over and over. They can't see you if you don't make noise. What did they mean? I checked my phone again, but still had no signal. I yelled out for help, but heard nothing. Judging by the state of the place, I figured it must have been abandoned. On top of everything else, the sky was starting to get dark. I made my way towards the garage behind the house and kicked in a door. The inside was in fairly good condition still. There was an old cabinet against the wall. I opened it up and saw some rusted jumper cables and a flashlight sitting on a shelf. I figured the battery in the crashed car might still have enough charge to jump my car, so I grabbed both of them. At this point, it was completely dark outside. I started walking back toward my car and was happy to see that the flashlight still worked. I was alternating walking fast and running something about the house and message had given me a bad feeling and I was eager to get back. I was walking alongside the road when I heard a scuffling sound out in the woods behind me. I stopped and looked back for a long moment. That's when I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned my flashlight forwards and saw a creature standing behind a tree. It moved its head in an erratic motion constantly twitching. It looked like a gigantic spider with a human head. Its eyes reflected the light of my flashlight like headlights. I heard more motion in the woods behind it. I locked my muscles in place. I gripped my phone hard and accidentally pulled the volume button, which I have set to take a picture on my phone's camera. My phone made the clicking camera noise. At that sound, 
the creature snapped its head in my direction and began moving around the tree. I pulled my arm back and threw my flashlight as hard as I could behind me on the road. The creature looked back behind me and with its spindle legs started walking towards the flashlight. I noted that it moved pretty slow. The moments it took to walk by me were an eternity. When I saw it was a dozen meters away, I started running down the road and did not look back. After an eternity, I reached my car, completely out of breath and full of adrenaline. Sarah opened her door and got out. Hey, you find any help? She asked. I yelled for her to stay in the car and ran up to the crashed one. I reached my hand into the broken window and popped its hood, then ran around and pulled its battery out. I attached the cables I'd brought to both batteries, and Sarah turned over our car's engine. I ripped the cables off of our battery and slammed the hood shut. I then jumped into the driver's seat and sped down the road. Once we made it home, I told Sarah about what happened. She started bawling and told me that she'd heard stories while growing up about the valley that we'd been in, and that it was the reason she was hesitant earlier. She never imagined that there was anything to them. I don't know what to think now. If I find anything else out, I will update you. This happened when I was around eight years old. I grew up in the Midwest, Ohio to be more specific. The town or village was not large by any means with around 40 to 50 people at most. During this time, my family didn't have the internet or cable TV and cell phones were just starting to become mainstream. And as such, entertainment was mostly chores or roaming the surrounding area exploring. My house was backed by fairly dense woods. There was a steep decline with a massive, relatively flat wooded area where a creek ran through. This creek wasn't very deep. Waist deep in certain areas, but mostly knee or ankle deep. But it was wide. Growing up, I lived in these woods, hiking up and down the creek, mapping the woods, exploring a few long abandoned and collapsed houses that nature reclaimed. I lived and breathed nature, and those woods were my home away from home. My father grew up in that area. My aunt, uncle and cousins lived just next door to it. It was a pretty close-knit community. Naturally, everyone has ghost stories about their hometown, a haunted house, a tragedy of some sort that remains a stain on its history. My village was no different. My father would always tell stories about ghosts or abnormal happenings he experienced in his youth. One thing he would always tell me when I told him that I was going into the woods was, the trees may not walk about or talk, but they see and they remember. I always thought of that as him saying, don't be stupid out there. My first encounter with people of the woods, which is what I've always called them, was when I was out on one of my daily excursions into the wild green. It was mid-July, hot and humid, and I stuck mostly to the creek as it was cool, and I didn't have to battle my way through thick undergrowth. I hiked approximately about two miles along the creek, hunting for crawdads or crawfish, and looking for signs of deer, rabbit, or the fabled albino squirrel. I kept traveling, and eventually reached a relatively open field that had waist-high grass. I frequently stopped here to gather wild blackberries, rest and spook the few white-tailed deer that bobbed in the area. But that day was different. As I drew closer to the field, I noticed someone standing there. Instinctively, I slowed down, lowered my posture and tried to minimize my noise. I wasn't used to seeing someone out this far into the woods. The nearest house to that location was about a mile and a half through thick undergrowth and fairly steep ravines to climb. As I hugged the bank of the creek, I moved to the edge of the open field, slowly peeking up over the tall grass to see if they were still there. But there was nothing. 
I thought that perhaps they had seen or heard me trudging through the creek and instinctively ducked too. I wasn't about to find out, so I turned around and headed back home all two and a half miles back. I was more aware of my surroundings and far more cautious of my sound as I moved, avoiding walking in the creek to prevent the sloshing of water to give me away. As I crept through the branches jutting out into the bank of the creek, I made my way to another area I was familiar with. A small game trail ran through here, and it would cut my time and distance back home a good bit. The only downside was it was pretty overgrown to either side, and portions had thick thorn bushes. The entire time I trekked back, I felt as if I was being watched. I never felt in danger or vulnerable of being attacked, but I could feel eyes on me. I was uneasy the entire time I followed the game trail, routinely stopping and listening to determine if I could hear footsteps or if I was being followed. Still nothing. I made it about halfway home when I saw in the corner of my eye a figure standing a short distance away. But as I moved my eyes in the direction of the figure, they seemed to just melt into the foliage. I thought maybe it was my paranoia and it was making me see things so I just carried on. A few hundred feet more I again see another figure, this time further away out of my peripheral and again as I looked in that direction they'd mailed back into the background. But this time it happened twice. As I looked and the figure disappeared, another appeared again in my peripheral, closer but still a ways away. The entire time I never felt to be in danger. Creeped out, yes, but I never felt like whatever was there was nefarious. This continued on for the remainder of my time making my way back home. But the more it happened, the less I felt I afraid of the figure, even going as far as saying out loud, I know you're there. I don't know what you want, but I'm not here to cause trouble. Eventually, I made it to my backyard and turned around to face the woods to see if they were there, but I saw nothing. My father was next to his shed, burning some cut grass in the backyard. I walked over to tell him what I had experienced and before I could say a word, he looked at me with a slight grin and said, I see you saw them too. I guess I had the look of terror written on my face. Without even missing a beat, he put down the hoe he was using to stoke the fire, walked past me to the wood line and pulled out the can of dip he had from his pocket. He opened it, took a pinch out and placed it on a stone that was just sitting there and then walked out. I asked him why he did that and he said he gave them an offering. He began explaining what he meant by the tree see and remember, that it was important that we respect nature whenever we enter her domain and give an offering in return when we take something from her. Otherwise, she may just not let us back out. He gave me the can of dip and said what I saw were what he believed to be the spirits of Native Americans watching over their former land. I didn't really know what they were at the time but I followed suit with what my dad did whenever I made my way back into the woods. I always left an offering. And although I still did see them from time to time, I never felt like I was in danger, and I always made sure to respect them. If they appeared in my peripherals, I would travel in the opposite direction. Apologies for any transgressions. The cousins and many people in my village were all aware of their existence and just kind of gave them a wide berth whenever they appeared. I was oblivious to their existence, but when I learned of them and experienced them, a whole lot of people opened up about them, about some of the history of the town. It was certainly an enlightening experience. I have always been an avid mountain person. When people say they go to the beach for vacation, I respect it, but I prefer the mountains 100%. Something about these old giants has always fascinated me, as if I just cannot avoid but to be drawn towards them and be in awe when hiking on them. Over my short life, a 21-year-old student, I consider that I've seen a fair amount of mountain ranges in Europe, from the Alps in Switzerland the Pyrenees in Spain, 
and from the Italian Dolomites to the Czech Stolaway Mountains, I have always hiked and camped outdoors a lot, with family and friends, but also by myself. Now, I went to the United States for college, and I have always been tempted to do a part of the Appalachian Trail. From the pictures I saw on the internet, I always wanted to see them in person, and I'm not gonna lie, I must say, that the great amount of scary stories of these mountains always attracted me a little as well. I'm definitely not a person who likes scary movies or anything, but I enjoy reading fellow mountaineer experiences, and to be honest, I mostly just read stories about the Appalachian Trail to know how to prep myself for when I was going to do it. The scary stories just got my attention every now and then. That being said, I decided to go this year and do a small part of the Appalachian Trail I went to do a small part between the borders of Tennessee and North Carolina, with Klingman's Dome being the icing on the cake. I was a little bit hesitant to go by myself, since I'm not very familiar with both the geography as well as the wildlife in this part of the states. I wanted to go with a friend or my girlfriend who's from North Carolina herself, but both my friend and my girlfriend declined because they had to go to work. This was during spring break. So, I decided I just had to go by myself, since I'm graduating this year and will return to Europe. I started at this place called Bryson City and walked along the Tecusagee River until I reached the Nolan Creek Trailhead. From there on, I just followed the trail until I would reach Klingman's Dome, and from Klingman's Dome, I would follow the Appalachian Trail for about a week. I had prepared well for this trip. I carried bear spray and pepper spray. I read some freaky stories about people in the Appalachian Trail, and I also brought this hunting knife and an axe for wood. I had some canned food and lots of water, plus a water filter, and for the rest, just my tent and sleeping bag. So, when I started walking from Bryson City and I saw the beautiful aura this mountain range had, I couldn't be happier. I had been wanting to do this since I had arrived here in the US, and I was finally doing it. I encountered some people on the Nolan Creek Trailhead who were friendly, but I had made up my mind I would be better off alone than with strangers. I reached Klingman's Dome the same day and went a little further before I would set up camp. It was beautiful. At night, I slept a bit off the trail with a small campfire while I had dinner, and which I put out before I went to sleep. The first night went really well, as I was so exhausted from the hike to Klingman's Dome. The next two days were just as beautiful, and I saw lots of breathtaking views. The people on the Appalachian Trail I encountered were really polite as well. Then, on the third night, I feel like everything took a strange turn. I'd set up my camp just as usual, around 160 feet from the trail. No one was camping close to me, or at least not that I was aware of. While getting dinner, I just had this really weird gut feeling that I was not alone there. I felt as if someone was looking at me from behind a tree or something. I tried to convince myself that I was having an amazing time, that I was safe, and that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. I went to sleep and put the fire out as usual. Then, before it was daylight again, I woke up. I woke up with this same gut feeling that, even though I was in my tent, that someone was watching my tent from a distance. I did not hear a single bird, which was weird because right before daylight is when they start chirping again. I only heard the wind and the leaves. It made me feel uncomfortable, a bit scared even. I didn't fall asleep again. And the first thing in the morning, after having breakfast in my tent, I broke up camp and decided to continue my hike. During my hike, I encountered a few people, and again they were very nice, but I stick to myself. While walking on this part of the trail by myself alone, I felt as if I was being watched again. I even had the feeling as if someone or something was following me. So, every now and then, I would stop dead in my tracks in order to hear if it was real. Now, obviously, my mind could be playing tricks, but I would swear that I would hear the steps stop a second after I'd stopped. So, according to me at that moment, 
someone was following me. I looked around the whole time, and I never saw anyone or anything, which made it even more weird. After the long day of hiking, I made camp, this time closer to the trail than usual, but for some reason I thought it would be more safe. I again had this gut feeling of being watched while having dinner outside my tent, so I decided to finish my food in my tent and went to the bathroom in a bottle because I did not want to go outside now. I tried to sleep by closing my eyes, but my mind focused on hearing the whole time, and that is when I heard it for the first time. A knock, as if a branch was hitting a tree or a small rock was getting thrown at a tree. Silence followed for what seemed like an eternity, but was probably more like ten minutes. Then it happened again, this time more clear. I was scared now, and I had no idea where to go since it was dark already. I put on my flashlight in the tent and made myself look as big as I could so that my shadow outside the tent would look bigger because of the light. I don't know why this was my reasoning at the time. I just thought of bears. I held my hunting knife in my hand. Silence followed the second knock, but now I shouted to pierce the silence in the dark. First I shouted that whoever was joking around, I was armed, and I was not wanting to be pranked. I thought this would scare them off. It did not. It was almost as if this person found it even more funny knowing I was pissed at them. I heard another knock, and immediately after a knock on what I assumed to be the opposite side of my tent. So now I was guessing it was two people instead of one and that they liked to pull a prank on an innocent passerby. I tried to stay up as long as I could, but around 4 a.m., my eyes just gave up, and I drifted off. I woke up at around 8 a.m. again, with the light of the sun being my savior. I first tried to hear if whoever was pranking me was still knocking. I didn't hear anything. I shouted again, stating that I was now going to exit my tent with my knife in my hand and that whoever had been joking around should make themselves known. I walked out of my tent, and I didn't see anyone. I looked for tracks around my camp, but I could not immediately make something out of it. I decided to get the hell out of there. The next part of my week basically continued being the same. At night, I'd hear some knocks from different directions, and occasionally, I heard what I would guess was a little bit of humming as if a person was just humming a tune. Now, I never saw anyone except from the occasional hikers on the Appalachian Trail, so I cannot say I saw something weird, but I could never get rid of this weird gut feeling that I was being watched and followed during the rest of my hike on the Appalachian Trail. I'm now back and I told this to my girlfriend. She said it was probably just my mind playing tricks on me, and I am inclined to believe her because I never saw anything, but I still sometimes wake up in the middle of the night thinking that I'm in that tent in the middle of nowhere and someone is watching me and knocking on a tree. And every time I wake up like this, the thought alone scares me. This happened to me, my brother, and our friends. Not a my sister's uncle's best friend story. This is personal and 100% the truth. Make no assumptions. Here are the facts. You make up your own mind as to what happened. I grew up in a small mountain town in Utah, away from civilization up a canyon. If you walk out my back door and through a 200 yard field, you will come upon a river and a small wooded area. We always called these the river bottoms, for obvious reasons. Summer of 2004, just before I turned 16. Our house was the go-to party location, always clean parties, and lots of people would show up. And most nights we would end up having a bonfire in the backyard with guitars and just chilling and watching the fire and the stars. Well, one night, we started telling ghost stories. 
One of my close friends lived a mile down the road with his house some distance away from the same river bottoms. Discussion turns from the fake ghost stories to real talk about weird things that have happened to us, and my friend quickly takes the attention. He tells two stories. The first was when he was younger, 10 or so. He wakes up in the middle of the night in the dead of winter and decides to go downstairs for a glass of water. His kitchen sink faces the river bottoms. While drinking, he looks up at the window and sees a man's face looking at him from outside. He drops the glass. It shatters on the floor and his mum comes in to see what happened. They turn on the porch light and look outside where there had been fresh snow and there was no man or any footprints. Okay, must have been a reflection, sure. A few weeks later, he's outside playing in the snow just after dark and his dog starts barking and growling towards the river bottoms. He looks out, can't see anything, but gets a weird feeling in his stomach and starts to go inside. He's about to go to the back door when he hears his dog behind him yelp. Then he comes running towards him. Again, turns around and can't see anything and runs inside. He finishes the story saying that he has always had this fear of the river bottoms and doesn't like going out there. Naturally, as a bunch of young men with something to prove, a few of my friends decide they are going to go out to explore. It's nearly a full moon and a clear night so visibility is pretty good. I think five made this trip. They leave about 15 or so of us just chilling around the fire for 10 minutes. Definitely not long enough to really get to the bottoms and explore anything, and they come running back to the fire. A few of them say they saw something out there, which isn't too out of the ordinary. The fields between my backyard and the bottoms frequently have cows, and it's common to see deer, coyotes, as well as other wildlife in the area. We talk them down and resume the guitars. One of my older brother's friends is sitting with his back facing the bottoms and has been unusually quiet since he got back and keeps turning his head to look behind him. Standing at six foot five and weighing 240 pounds plus, it was very out of character. And eventually, a second group decides to go out. This time we go inside and gather up flashlights, hockey sticks, baseball bats, whatever we can find just in case. This time we have a group of about 10, which includes myself, and we get about halfway to the river bottoms when I started to get a really dark feeling. I related to fear, but it was so much more, just like something wasn't right. The only time I've had fear like this was when I had a gun pointed at me a few years ago and had genuine fear of my life. Then we start to hear this faint whistle, almost like you would hear with the wind in a wooded area, but we weren't in the trees yet. Then we heard it again in a different direction, then directly behind us, much faster than a person could have moved without being heard or seen. We get freaked out and clumped together. We hear the whistle again, and the two with flashlights both zero in on the spot to our left. And what we see just for a fraction of a second is a dark silhouette, maybe three to four feet high and red reflection in the eyes. Then it darts away at insane speed and we lose it. Knowing that everyone saw this thing, we all make a mad dash for the house. Getting back to the fire, we decided we didn't want to stay there any longer. We put out the fire in typical youth fashion. All the boys stood in a circle and peeing on it until the coals were gone and climbed in the cars and left. About an hour or so later, my brother and I get home and as we're pulling into the driveway, we see the fire in a blaze again. Still feeling creeped out, we go to put it out with the hose and all of the wood that we had in the stacks a few feet away had been thrown into the pit. Very weird. The next day, we're having Sunday dinner with my parents. Quick side story. My dad grew up in the 50s in a neighboring house where we currently live. They ask if we had fun last night, and my brother says, yeah, but I don't know if anyone would be coming back anymore. Why is that? Do you guys see the bogeyman? 
Yeah, Dad, we saw the bogeyman, chuckled my brother sarcastically. Really? I saw the bogeyman once. I was really little, probably eight or nine. I remember I was really sick and had a fever. I remember looking out my front door one night, around dusk, and seeing this dark shape next to our mailbox. Its head was just below the mailbox, and it was looking at me with glowing red eyes. It was at that point that my brother and I both looked at each other. Did you tell him what happened? We both knew he had been telling the truth. A few weeks later, we again are having a bonfire at the house, when we notice that the river bottom seemed to be glowing a little ways away. We hop in the car and get almost to my friend's house when we see that the bottoms are on fire. We call 911 to report it. It is government land and decide to go out and see it for ourselves while waiting for the fire department to arrive. It wasn't super out of control and as we get there, we see that it's just the grass burning in a small clearing. We decide that we could probably even stamp it out. It just looks like a few lines burning in about a 10 foot radius. We get out and one of my friends starts walking in a circle, following the burnt ash and looks towards the middle. He then starts to climb a tree. And as he gets a few feet up, he says, guys, this is a pentagram. The weird thing is that it had been burning for at least half hour before we got there but the grass was still burned into a perfect pentagram. No spreading at all. Super weird. A few days later, we hear about how there are people arrested a few years ago for performing devil worship in the river bottoms. They would regularly burn pentagrams into the ground and slaughter animals in the center. So over the next year, this story spreads through the town and it becomes this sort of legend. My brother has this mythology class in the spring and the final project was to create a myth. The teacher, knowing this story, suggests to my brother that he uses this as his story and gives it some depth. Greek mythology integrated with real life. My brother, give life to the name of Nephus Gawain, or Go for short. A story about a mortal cursed by Zeus for an affair with Hera, doomed to be a river demon for the rest of time. But the background story is not enough. He decided he needed evidence. We decided to start the night off the same way we did the first night. On fire with about 15 to 20 people, guitars, ghost stories, then gal stories. We called this the ritual, and it seemed to invite whatever it was. After a few hours, we decided it was time. We head towards the bottoms with a video camera in night mode and spot lights. Everyone has their own flashlight, BB guns, you name it. We get about halfway out in the dark feeling comes upon us. Again, I really have to stop and stress this feeling. Fear like you know something wants you dead. This time we don't hear the whistling, but we do hear a rush of something moving quickly and very close. We can't manage to get it in the lights or on the camera, so we decide that we have to keep going. We are still about 20 meters from the bottoms, and there is a small hill ridge that separates the fields from the river. The front person stops moving and asks for the spotlight. He shines it up on this ridge and standing next to a tree is the black shape with glowing red eyes, four feet tall, looking like a child wearing a hooded trench coat, but so black that it seems to be made from a black hole. It stays there and stares right back at us. It felt like it was there forever. All of us staring. Does everyone see that? With the cameraman saying, Focus, damn it. Then it slowly takes two steps towards the tree and disappears behind it and does not come out from the other side. Screw the project. Screw everyone else. Panic sets in and everyone starts running towards the house. We get to the backyard where we have to cross a barbed wire fence. Our house does have a lot of outdoor lighting, so we figure once we cross the fence we'll be safe. The cameraman is on the field side, still pointed towards the bottoms when he realizes he's the last one on that side of the fence. Quick panic, and he turns to hop over. We all get inside and after trying to calm down, we decide we need to see the footage. We watch everything, trying to see if we caught anything weird on the early part. Nothing. We get to the ridge and the camera just did not want to focus. It faces the ridge, super blurry. 
He pulls it down, looks at feet, and it would focus back up and blur again. You could hear, it's going behind the tree, and then bam, focus as clear as day. Obviously extremely disappointed, everyone starts up their own conversations. My brother starts the tape over again from the beginning and sits right below the TV staring at it, no talking. He is pausing and rewinding frame by frame at the blurry part, trying to find something, but none of the footage seems usable. He gets to the part where we are almost back at the house and my friend, the one from the beginning stories, just happens to be watching, and at the end says, hold on, go back. They go real slow, frame by frame again, as the cameraman hops the fence. As he hops, the camera faces slightly into the yard to the left, and standing next to a tree not five feet away is a small black figure with red glowing eyes. In the yard five feet away from him, less than 10 away from most of the rest of us. None of us saw it or knew it was there, but we had it on camera. So back in those days, we had these things called VHS tapes. You put movies on them and my brother and his friend edited the movie and made two copies, one for us and one to turn into his teacher for the project. These tapes both included the footage we shot that night, as well as most of the story we have told here. A few years later, my brother and I decided we wanted to watch it, but couldn't find the tape anywhere. We searched the whole house, nothing. We did not want to fail, so we called up his mythology teacher who we knew had this tape and had even shown it to his class and asked if we could borrow it to copy it. And of course, he also seemed to have misplaced his copy. To this day, I still don't go to the river bottoms. I don't like to bring up the story when people or family members ask me to tell it, because I know they'll think I'm either lying or that it was just youthful fear playing tricks on my mind. I know what I saw and I know what I felt. It was real. And though I don't know what it was, something decided to come and torment me and my friends in our teenage years. And I'm 100% confident in saying that it wanted to see us dead. This all went down during the spring break of my junior year of high school. My school was in a pretty small Iowa town with a district spanning several smaller hamlets. During the summer of 2014, a few friends of mine put together a film club that would make short films and compete in national film festivals against other schools. We were a pretty small group and found it kind of difficult to get together for any actual filming until spring break of 2015 when we made plans for a little excursion. Four of us ended up going on the trip, myself and three members of the club, Jake, Bill, and Kyle. We ended up choosing to go camping out at Mossy Glen Hollow, a supposedly haunted state park up in northeastern Iowa. Since the 1850s, there have been several murders and suicides out at Mossy Glen, including a few decapitations and a hired hitman in the 1930s. Being the edgy teens that we were, we jumped at the chance to go hiking and camping somewhere like that. It was within 15 minutes of a small town as well, so stocking up on food wouldn't be that big of an issue either. So, all lights green, we loaded up two of our sedans, programmed the GPS, and off we were for a spring break, camping in some haunted woods. After the first hour and a half on the road, a few red flags began to fly. After the last large town before getting way out in the boondocks, my phone's data signal cut out and the GPS randomly changed directions on us. Since none of us had any idea where the hell we were or where Mossy Glen was supposed to be, we didn't have much choice but to blindly follow the new route. To save on continuity, I'm going to throw this section in the end. It's not really important to the story, but it can give a bit of perspective on how places like Mossy Glen Hollow end up in the legal state that this place was in. Once we were firmly in the middle of nowhere, our GPS took us off the paved highways and onto gravel roads. At this point, you typically would see the usual brown Iowa DNR signs designating that you were near a state park, but there were none. 
There weren't even any tree clumps to indicate that you were near some sort of forest. Red flag number two. About another ten minutes or so into the drive, and the gravel road soon turns to a dirt road, then a low maintenance road, then a class B minimum maintenance road. With Iowa's dedication to road preservation, this basically means that somebody probably came by and took a peek in the 90s and then promptly forgot about its existence. As we come around the last hilly bend that the GPS shows on our route, we see a farmhouse with a large machine shed with no lights or activity around either, and no cars in the driveway. A bit weirded out that a house would be right next to a state park, we slow down and keep rolling. To our dismay, however, the road dissolves into a mess of washed tractor tire gouges from last fall's harvest. We stop the cars as far down as we can pass without getting hung up on a frozen rut and unpack some of our equipment. The road gradually narrows, snakes down the middle of a field, and turns down into the small but very thick clump of woods at the bottom of a wide ravine. We get out and hike down the gradually steepening slope and take in the scenery. At first, everything looks like a pretty damn cool set to film at. There are several limestone outcrops hanging off the hillside, a footpath with some picturesque tree overhang, and even a few birds out that made an unseasonal return from wintering down south. We can all hear some water running, but can't identify a source from the trail. Looking off in any direction, all we could see was a seemingly endless sea of trees. At the bottom of the hill was a small pond, in the middle of a grassy clearing with a fence. As we approached the fence, we notice a sign. Private property. Keep out. Bill checks his watch and realizes that it's almost time for dinner, so we trek back to our vehicles and hook up the GPS. The nearest town over was a little place called Edgewood that had several diners and a gas station to load up on supplies for the week. We brought some canned food, but not much beyond that. As we got to town, we realized that Edgewood was a lot smaller than we had expected. Less than 900 people, it would turn out. Everyone knows everyone in these small towns, so we got several weird looks when four strangers rolled up with plates from the other side of the state. Kyle thought to ask the cashier and a few people at the gas station about Mossy Glen Hollow, and why the only route in was through some guy's field on a busted out dirt road. To our surprise, nobody had even heard of a place called Mossy Glen, nor could they figure out why the hell four high schoolers suddenly rolled into town looking for the place. Red flag number three. We shrug it off as just a few crazy locals, and take off back down the dirt trail. As we round the corner back near the farmhouse, we notice that all the lights are still off and nobody seems to be home. I suggest that we leave some sort of note on the house door that we're going to be parking on the side of the road near their place, just to be safe. It is starting to get late in the day, and being this far out in the country, it wouldn't be unheard of to come face to face with a shotgun when the homeowners find our cars. Since the road is impassable from that point on anyway, parking there wouldn't realistically block anybody off the road and would still technically be on public land. We hike back down the wooded trail and start scouting for a place to set up camp for the night. Making sure to be on the public side of the fence pond area, we discover that the sea of trees that we saw earlier was actually quite a bit thinner when seen from below. In fact, the dirt path led to a decently sized clearing with a creek and small waterfall cutting through the limestone deposits. None of us could believe that we had missed such a thing a few hours earlier. When Bill comes to a realization, he disappears around the corner back into the trees and emerges at the top of the trail a few minutes later. Though we could plainly see him, the trees lined up just right so that he could not see anything beyond the rocks below the path ledge. Continuing further up the creek, we notice there are conveniently placed rocks about the perfect distance apart to step without disturbing the water or surrounding rocks. One could walk almost silently up and down the creek 
while the sound of the water masked the steps. Not thinking much of it, we take some pictures of the large moss-covered boulders all around and get some pretty nice scenic shots. We find a place to make camp and everything is going great until we approach the waterfall. Just before the waterfall sat a clearing without any large boulders or rocks and an odd arrangement of logs. One sat horizontal, supported at each end by two piles of rocks. In front sat a crude stone circle with a pile of burnt logs inside, a fire pit with a bench. Though a bit surprised at first, we shrug it off as some weekend project that the people of the house put together. After all, with such a cool place just a short walk from home, why not? I have a similar fire pit set up at home, so I'm not too concerned. Hey, what the hell is this? Kyle yells from a boulder a few yards ahead. On it sat a blaze orange hoodie, a single gardening glove, an empty can of beer, and a stick of deodorant that had seen some serious wear. Looking closer at the beer can, we realize that it must have been opened fairly recently. Foam is still fresh in the bottom of the can, and it still had a funny smell. Bewildered by what the hell we just found, Jake starts looking around the other side of the boulders upstream of the items. Holy shit, there's a cave over here, he shouts back to us. Later, he told us that the cave was large enough to comfortably fit a person inside, and that, more disturbingly, he saw some red fabric inside as well. Before he can get a good look around, Kyle calls the three of us back over to him with a sense of urgency. He speaks very quietly to us and indicates that we shouldn't shout back. Shampoo. Fucking shampoo. He whispers, pointing urgently down at his feet. Sure enough, in the mud and leaves, there's a bottle of suave shampoo right next to the creek. At this point, we're all adequately freaked the fuck out and ready to call our little soiree quits. Bill remains pretty sure that this is just junk left behind by the people up at the house after a weekend a few too many bush lights. But things just didn't add up to me. There's one detail that I've been leaving out up to this point. The day before, this part of Iowa got some heavy rain which contributed to the mud situation on the road and on the trail. With the combination of wind and rain, the items on the rocks would have shown some signs of being wet if not been displaced entirely. Also, the air was pretty cold as it is every year around this time, not getting above the mid 40s for the whole week. Then everything starts to click for me. Whoever drank the beer and left the shampoo, hat, glove, and deodorant there must have done so sometime this morning. The fire pit also had some fresh char marks on the rocks and the wood had not been wet for a while, meaning that it must have been lit last night at the earliest. The small cave would have provided enough shelter from the rain to stay dry. With the freezing temperatures all throughout the day, whoever was using the shampoo out here must have had little other choice to do so. If it was the homeowners, they would have had to be serious masochists to bathe in the shallow, freezing, rocky creek rather than at home. If it wasn't them, then we likely weren't alone right now. Whoever left these things out left in a hurry. And if they were here four hours ago, they would have been able to see us on the trail cliff long before we even knew they were down here. Remembering the arrangements of rocks on the stream, they could have even been leaving their camp just as we were coming down the dirt trail. As I processed this, I started to look around at my surroundings and realized that the small area was bordered by the thick trees on the trail side, several sets of huge boulders on the pond side, and limestone cliffs everywhere else. Due to the tree, rock, and hill cover, you could light a fire in the pit at night, and nobody around would ever know. The illusion of being able to see up the dirt trail from the camp, but not down, played in reverse from the cliffs. If you were wearing brown or green, you could easily see down from the rocks on top to the camp below 
while blending in with the trees above. Coming to these realizations, I noticed something else, something more sinister. The birds and small animals that we previously heard are now quiet. Aside from the soft babble of the creek, the entire place is completely silent. As I start to explain this to the rest of the group, I see the wheels turning in their heads as well. Jake starts to head back to the small cave when a rustling up on the limestone ridge line catches our attention. Something large was shifting around up there, something that apparently didn't want Jake to see what was in that cave. We all look up, and whatever or whoever made that noise starts shuffling down the ridge toward the makeshift camp. Because of the high cliff, the only way back down to us would be by going all the way back down to the pond and then double back up the stream. Realizing this, and almost shitting ourselves at how open we were, we book it back up the stream, up the dirt path, across the field, and back to our cars. On the drive back to Edgewood, we all try and process what the fuck just happened back there. I take a look at a satellite map, and the only really accessible way to the cliff where we heard the noise would be to walk up there from the pond. It was too craggy to approach from the adjacent field to the east. Whatever made that noise would had to have been large too, and a deer getting up there wouldn't necessarily be out of the question. It would have had some incredible timing to have started moving around just as Jake started looking at the cave and whatever red fabric was inside. Kyle found a report of an escaped convict from a local prison a few weeks ago and was convinced that it was his camp that we found. Though we were all doubtful at best of this idea, to satisfy his concerns, we agreed to report the strange things we found to the police anonymously, since we all wanted to really get home at this point. None of us followed up on them though, and I doubt anything came out of it. A small, close-knit town police department gets a report of strange sightings from some stranger the same day that four high schoolers roll up and park outside a farmer's house for a few hours and then book it out doesn't exactly spell high threat criminal activity to me. Still, things just don't seem to add up. Whoever came running down that cliff, if it indeed was a who, wanted to keep whatever was inside that cave hidden, but not enough to actually fight four decently tall and able teenagers. We figured he just wanted to scare us off, since the noises seemed to stop once we reached the dirt path. I thought it odd that someone living out in the woods with something seemingly to hide would set up shop in a state park, that is, until I checked my GPS again. That little reroute that it took us on was an old entrance to the park that had been cut off by the purchase of the lake area sometime between the map records used for Google's navigation being updated, and that day. The current entrance to the park is about two miles north of where the GPS sent us, thinking it found a faster route. The place we were at was still public land for sure, but not quite what we pictured. So, guy in Mossy Glen Hollow, let's not meet. Seven years ago, my wife and I purchased a property and 11 acres of woods in a rural part of northeastern Minnesota. The woods were connected to a large acreage of fields and woods about 160 acres, and although sparsely populated, the land is near a fairly busy state highway. There are some housing developments in the area, but they are three to four miles away and the majority of land around our property are farm fields, woods and rivers. It's remote, but with towns so close I wouldn't call it wild by any means. I'm mentioning this because I've heard of many Native American legends of things in the deep northern woods of Minnesota and Canada, but the area in which we live is not that. Rural, yes, but not the endless north woods. I would like to say I'm not a believer in the supernatural, and I've never been afraid of the woods or the outdoors, 
even though I have a healthy sense to caution and respect it because of large bears, moose, wolves, and other potentially dangerous wildlife. I am also an avid hunter and mountaineer and have experienced many nights in the wilderness. I have had numerous encounters with dangerous animals or situations, so I'm not spooked easily. Knowing my state of mind is important to my story because many so-called supernatural encounters can be explained by people with an already high level of belief, anxiety, or fear, which would not be my case. Well, that all changed after a few weeks after moving in. The house and land had been abandoned for a few years due to foreclosure, so a lot of work needed to be done to get it back in shape. Wildlife had grown accustomed to no human presence, and black bears frequently roamed the yard at night, along with many other woodland creatures. We also found a lot of animal bones scattered throughout the woods, and coyotes were abundant. One night during those first few weeks, we had a rainstorm, and I was worried about a broken downspout potentially causing a basement leak. It was around 10 p.m., so I grabbed my headlamp and headed outside to deal with the situation. Behind our house is a fairly large swampy area that divides the woods. I had my back facing this area while fiddling with the downspurt, when suddenly I had this intense feeling of dread. It's really hard to explain the feeling, but it was like my body knew something was back there. It was very unusual, based on the circumstances, never having felt this type of fear before. I tried to stay calm and slowly turned around to point my headlamp back towards the swamp. What I saw was something I still cannot explain. Eyes, numerous, glowing and reflecting, staring back at me. These were not eye reflections that you typically see with a deer or other animal, since they were at different heights. And when I pointed my headlamp spot beam directly at them, where you would expect a head to be, there was nothing but weeds and trees. When I turned the headlamp off, they were still there, and glowing as if light were being shined. They didn't move. They just stared through me. Needless to say at this, I bolted and ran as fast as I could back into the house and explained it away as a deer or raccoons. Later that summer, I was sitting out on our screened-in porch that partially faces the swamp and connected woods to the west. It was approximately 11 p.m. when I began to hear what sounded like a bear fighting with or attacking a cow. Since there was a small farm to the southwest of my property, I assumed that perhaps a cow had wandered into the woods and been attacked by a bear. I really didn't know if this was something a bear would actually do, but it was my only guess based on the sounds I was hearing at the time. It was clearly some kind of roar, like a bear but then followed by a frantic sounding cow mooing. This went on for over an hour, and it was perhaps one of the most horrible sounds I'd ever seen. Even though it sounded so strange and almost supernatural, it didn't frighten me since I had this rational explanation in my head. Even weirder, the same series of sounds happened again the next summer. These first few years, I never investigated the area of the woods that the sounds came from, as it was not my property. A few years later, I had the chance to purchase this area and 70 acres to the west, which consisted of the woods that connected to mine, as well as a few fields, more woods and ponds. As part of purchasing this land, I spent a great deal of time walking around it to get a good understanding of its value and layout. As part of my walk, I was able to get a much better look at the farm set up to the south. The farm did have cows, as I suspected, but to my surprise, the area they were keeping in was a long distance from my house, much too far for me to hear them, and the fence was also extremely well built as well as electrified. Looking at it, there was no way a cow was wandering off that farm. I didn't really think about this fact until recently, but I feel it's best to explain things in chronological order. After acquiring the property, I proceeded to put up tree stands in various locations along with trail cameras in order to prepare for the upcoming deer hunting season. One spot was the hilly woods 
where I heard those sounds many years prior. Again, I did not connect these two things until now. The area was very odd, as whenever I hiked through there, I always saw some strange new thing. One time my son and I found an old game snare tied to a tree, with what looked like dried blood on the tree bark. Another time we found an at least a hundred year old tree with a barbed wire fence completely spiraling the tree trunk, growing in and out of it at different intervals. I've also found many tree trunks with very large scratches or claw marks, not resembling an antler rub, perhaps a bear. We'd almost always find dead animal bones in the area, and even this winter, I found a few deer legs snapped and picked clean. My sons have found numerous animal skulls there as well. As I was saying, I put a game camera in this year since I'd seen tracks and signs and wanted to get a sense of the best places to hunt. I've placed one out there many seasons and have yet to capture a single thing on it. Nothing. My son has posted there a few times for hunting season and has mentioned the strange sense of quiet. He's used to the forest sounds returning after sitting there for long periods of time, but in this spot there are never really any sounds. He has mentioned hearing something walking around though. Another incident occurred one hunting season when I was entering this area en route to another stand, when I saw a violent thrashing thing in the foliage moving fast and crossing from left to right but moving away from my position. I of course encounter deer and bear all the time, so I am familiar with how they move when spooked. But this was something different. Whatever this thing was, was making a high pitched trumpeting combined with the bellowing sound that was like nothing I'd ever heard from an animal outside of an elk, which we didn't have in this area. It wasn't bounding and there wasn't the raised white tail or large dark mass to indicate a bear or deer. There really didn't appear to be a body at all just whipping and falling leaves and branches, along with deafening sounds. A year after this incident, my son went hiking out of the woods to try and find me since I was out doing some forest management. As he walked through this area, he thought he spotted me coming through the woods quickly, but soon noticed the walk and clothing were not like mine. Whoever it was was a lot taller than me, and he described him as extremely thin. He said the person he saw did not notice him at all and seemed to be walking in a straight line like they had tunnel vision. Seeing something in this part of the woods and their direction of travel didn't at all make sense since there really would be no reason to be there or head out that far as it leads to deep ravines and uncrossable rivers. After he found me and explained what he saw, I quickly went over to investigate to see if we had a trespasser. I hiked for quite a while, but never found anything or anyone. If someone was there, they either got picked up on the road or vanished. That same year, my son had a friend over and they went for a late afternoon walk in the woods. As it began to get dark, they made their way back by walking on the edge of the field that is next to this area of woods. As they passed by, they said they saw a figure a little ways off in the trees. Whatever they saw was near one of the hills in this patch of forest and seemed to be making some kind of hand gestures. It began walking slowly towards them when they called out, Hey, hello. He or it stopped still and said nothing. It was at this point the boys sensed something wasn't right and bolted back towards the house. They rushed into the house and told me what they saw and I of course laughed it off as the mind playing tricks on them. My son described the figure as tall, about 10 to 15 feet, but with skinny arms and his body was dark all over. Not hairy per se, but just dark. And even though it was an animal at first because of the weird way it looked, he couldn't really describe it very well other than gaunt or skinny and strangely dark. Me being the curious and protective father that I am, was worried about it being trespassers, drug addicts, or both. So I told them I would go to take a look. They took me to the area and pointed to where it was standing, and I headed into the woods. Since it was winter, there was snow on the ground. I thought it would be easy to find the tracks of whatever this thing was to find out where it came from or went. 
when I go to this spot there wasn't a single track or disturbance in the snow. There was no way an animal or man could have been here and not left any tracks. They had either made it up or their minds had played tricks on them, or so I thought. To this day, my son and his friend still swear they saw it clear as day, and I can definitely attest that their fright was real. My wife had also experienced this strange thrashing sounds and other feelings of dread of being watched in these part of the woods, and generally refuses to go over there anymore. All of this brings me to today, where I had a sudden realization that all of the strange sounds, sightings, bones, and events seems to be centered around this one area, and I'm just at a complete loss for what it all means. It's all too strange to really bring this up and discuss with people I know around here, but I wanted to share this with you in the community, to see if you have any theories or ideas on what we may be dealing with. I'll continue to investigate on my end, but would love to get your feedback. I went to one of these matchmaking parties a while back. I was tired of being alone, and I just really wanted to meet a nice guy. I'm a woman, by the way. Now, I realize that I was better off staying alone, and you'll soon find out why I feel that way. It went kind of well, and I actually ended up being asked out by someone. The guy wasn't exactly my type, if I'm being honest. I mean, he was pretty good looking, but I think that he was a little immature for me. Also, he was younger too. I decided to give him a try because he asked me out for a drive, and I thought that was a little more interesting than sitting in a coffee house sharing awkward silences. He came to pick me up in the morning. I got in his car, and we set off for our driving date. We planned on going to a little tourist location with some great views. We were going to have some lunch and then head home in the evening. It was a nice morning and afternoon. He convinced me that he wasn't as immature as I thought he was. It was a fun date. When it started to get dark out, we set about heading back to our hometown. It was when we were driving home that night that I noticed a change in his behavior. He was starting to act strange. The vibes he was putting out were very much, I don't want you to go yet, and please don't leave me. I put up with his neediness, expecting him to change his attitude once he noticed that it was making me uncomfortable. But he didn't change. His neediness and his bossiness were strong. The guy who had made me laugh, and who I was keen to have a second date with, was gone. And now a domineering and controlling guy was sat in the driving seat. We had discussed earlier how we both had work in the morning. I thought about that part of our date as I noticed how dark it was getting out. He wasn't interested in trying to converse with me any longer, nor was he interested in trying to make me smile or laugh. He had created such a horrible atmosphere in the car that I could hardly bring myself to mention to him about how late it was getting. I decided that I would ditch him as soon as I was able to get out of the car. For my plan to work, I just needed him to stop. We were going down dark country lanes. There weren't many opportunities to ask him to stop. I bided my time, and when I saw the lights of a convenience store up ahead, I said aloud the sentence I had been practicing in my mind for the last 15 minutes. Hey, do you mind pulling over? I want to use the bathroom, I asked. He agreed, and I thought I'd get away from this weirdo. I expected him to pull over into the convenience store's parking lot, but he zoomed past it. I said something like, Hey, why didn't you stop? And he replied, I know a public restroom closer to home. I hated that. He could have easily stopped, but he didn't. He eventually did stop, but he stopped at a public bathroom in the middle of nowhere. I doubted that there would even be cell reception, but I checked my phone before getting out, and I noticed that I had a couple of bars. I figured that I would be able to guide someone to come pick me up from here or at least share my location, so I took my chance. I got out of the car, stood up, and then stooped to pick up my handbag. I grabbed one handle of the bag and turned to walk to the bathroom. Then, I felt some resistance. 
It was like my bag was stuck. I looked back and saw my date was holding the other handle of my bag. I stood there, stunned. I couldn't believe that this guy could get any worse. My eyes then met his, and he said to me, Do you really need that if you're just using the bathroom? I just dropped my phone in my handbag, so I couldn't even grab that. I froze. I really didn't know what to do. I couldn't be left out in the middle of nowhere with no bag, no phone, and no coat. I wasn't really paying attention to what roads we'd been on, so I didn't know how long it would take me to get home. I reluctantly had to get back into that creep's car. We set off. I had to hide my fear from him. He was controlling, but he wasn't going to beat me. I didn't want him to think he had some kind of power over me. I didn't want to give him that victory. I next tried to hint that it was hot and I needed something to drink. I was surprised that he really didn't need all that much convincing. I guessed that he was thirsty too. I mean at this point, we'd been driving around and around for a couple of hours. As we approached a convenience store, he parked up in the furthest spot away and said he would be right back. He darted out of the car and I thought to myself, now's my chance. I tried to make a break for it as he ran into the store, but the door would not budge. He must have locked the door. He came back and he had a big smile on his face. As soon as he opened his door, I shot across into his seat and pushed my weight against the door. This caused him to back up a bit. I told him that if he didn't leave me alone, that I would be calling the police. One of the convenience store staff members stepped out at the perfect time to take the garbage bags out and was alerted to our heated exchange. When he realized that he was being watched, he tutted at me and shook his head. He then got into his car and sped away. I called a taxi and got myself home. I was shaken up but I tried my best to hold it together until I was behind a closed door. Then, it all came out. I was really upset. I later found out when I spoke to the police about him that he stalked his ex-girlfriend and had an official police caution just a month before we went out on our driving date. It feels amazing to be saying that I got home in one piece because I truly don't know what that guy is capable of. I hope. I never run into him again. This was back in January early this year. My friend and I had just started working on our film project and were getting ideas of locations to shoot the film. We drove to a swinging bridge about an hour away from our hometown. It was your usual unsturdy bridge that was about 400 feet long and 60 feet above water. This bridge was only meant for walking, no running, biking, or whatever else across it. It was parallel to another bridge, one made for vehicles. My friend and I got a couple of shots of the bridge itself before we made our way back to the other side, where there were train tracks and a neighborhood. About halfway across the bridge, we heard yelling coming from the other one. We looked, and it appeared to be a lady waving her arms like she was trying to get our attention. She called out a name, what I thought was Hayden or Aiden, which both of those were neither mine or my friend's name. We yelled back, we're not them, thinking that would be the end of the conversation. The woman just stood there, staring at us. We tried to shrug it off as we thought it had been settled, but then the woman takes off full speed running across the bridge in the same direction we were going. We thought it was strange, but we just laughed it off and carried on. We made it to the other side of the bridge and began shooting footage near the tracks. I know it's unsafe, but this was a regular crossing point for the bridge trail. While in the middle of the scene, I heard a familiar voice yell from behind me, it was the same woman, yelling the same thing. She stood on top of the hill of that neighborhood across the tracks. Again, we yelled back that we don't know her and we're not the people who she thinks we are. This woman takes off running again, but this time towards us. This frightened us, 
because why would this woman need to get to us that bad? My friend and I quickly grabbed our things and headed for the swinging bridge. Even knowing we weren't supposed to run across, we walked really fast, which made the bridge sway. It's like our fight or flight kicked in. The lady had caught up to the start of the bridge by the time we made it halfway across, still yelling, but this time it was in a hateful tone. This was when I turned around to look once to see how far the distance between us was. The lady had stopped at the start of the bridge, and I noticed she was holding something behind her back. Even though she had stopped running after us, we continued to bolt across the bridge. We turned back once we reached the other side to see the woman still standing there, fiddling with something in her hands. My friend pulled out her phone and began recording the woman. This made her turn back immediately and walk the other way. We never found out why she chased us or what she was holding in her hand. Sometimes I think back and wonder if maybe she needed help. But why not scream for help? I just find it strange that after we told her multiple times that we weren't the people she thought we were, and she still followed us. I had difficulty sleeping about a week after this incident, as I couldn't get the idea out of my head of what this woman wanted to do with us. I had never been so scared in my life. I'm from the countryside. In fact, my family home lies just behind the shadow of a tall mountain. The land that the mountain stands on is actually owned by my grandfather. Our family have always been happy to allow villagers to use the land, as long as a small portion of their profits are shared with us. By that, I mean the grounds are free to walk, the fields are free to work, and the game is free to hunt. To me, that doesn't seem like that much of a bad deal. Due to my family's history of being somewhat more than kind with this arrangement, we have been beset by thieves over the years. Since our family wanted to make sure we continued this community spirit, the elder men in my family offered to patrol the mountain ranges at night in search of thieves. My family would often remind me of areas on the mountain range that would be dangerous at night. In their words, it was for adults only. The adult world, no children allowed. It didn't stop me and my friends exploring though. We found out pretty quickly why the adults didn't want us to play in those areas. For one, the wildlife, but more realistically, there was a pretty deep cave and to us kids, that cave was one of our favorite playgrounds. It felt like it was ours. So that leads me to this experience I had when I was a kid, which I'm certain that will live with me for the rest of my days. I was playing in the forbidden areas of the mountain range, like normal, in the cave. All of a sudden, I had the urge to pee, so I decided to head out and do it behind a tree. We were usually nervous about being in places where we were explicitly told not to play in, but being caught peeing out there, well that really gave me the willies, if you'll uh, pardon the expression. I was basically double scared of being caught. I kept looking around to make sure that the coast was clear, but then, as I was midstream, I saw someone. There was a stranger walking up towards the cave. He was down by the river. I shot back behind the tree. I didn't even have a chance to pull my pants up. He was a middle-aged guy by the look of it, and I didn't know that man. I hadn't ever seen him before. I knew everyone who was permitted to use the mountain range. It wasn't a big village. My family had been talking about someone who had been stealing mushrooms. And that may sound trivial, but some of these mushrooms that we grew, they could fetch a pretty price. It made sense that this stranger could be the thief everyone was talking about. He was carrying a backpack, and he was clearly on the lookout for something. 
If this was the thief that my family was so worried about, then I didn't want to be seen by him. I stayed as still as possible, out of sight, in the trees and bushes. I felt like such an idiot. This was exactly what my parents had warned me about. I watched the stranger. It looked like he was looking for something, and he was being cautious. I kept an eye on him to make sure he didn't spot me, or tried to come close. I mean, I had no plan if he did come close. I was just too scared to take my eyes off of him. I watched him for a while, and then I noticed someone approaching from behind him. I knew who was approaching very well. He was my uncle. He approached the stranger. My uncle was holding a shovel. He stopped the guy, and it looked like those two were in conversation. I was too far away to make out anything that they were saying, though. My uncle seemed to be admonishing the guy, giving him a real telling off, you know? The stranger, or should I say, thief, took off his backpack at what looked to be the order of my uncle. My uncle then snatched the thief's backpack. He opened it, and then I saw my uncle get very angry. Then something happened that I didn't think would ever be a possibility. My uncle smacked the thief across the back of the head with the shovel. The thief went limp and just fell flat on his face in the dirt. My uncle then dragged the stranger into the river and watched as his lifeless body bobbed downstream. My uncle then walked off in the opposite direction like nothing happened. That scared the hell out of me. My uncle was the younger of the two brothers, the elder being my dad. And man, my uncle had my sides aching so many times when I was a kid. He was hilarious. But in that moment, he didn't look anything like himself. He looked so cold and expressionless. It gets worse, because he came round to our house for dinner that night. And I had to sit opposite him, knowing what I knew. He was smiling and joking as usual. It was as if nothing had happened. At one point, he looked at me right in the eyes, and I thought to myself for a brief second while he and my father spoke about trespasses on the mountain range, do you know? The thief didn't ever come back. I'm not sure what happened to him, but I can guess based on what I saw. If he did manage to get away, he never went to the police or anything. I learned about the adult world that they had warned me about with their off-limit areas that day. It was a really scary experience, and I haven't been able to look at my uncle the same way since. This happened to me when I was at elementary school. It would usually take me about 30 minutes to walk home from school. I lived close to the seafront, so it was always a nice walk. On the way home, there were two sets of traffic lights on a big two-lane road. My school was by the seaside. I loved it. I used to walk in a group of close friends of about three or four. We used to chat about the latest fads and fashions, homework, that sort of thing. It was a really fun time when I think back to it. It was summertime in my third year of elementary school. As usual, I was waiting for my friends outside of school by the playground after school finished. I noticed an old man in a white car staring at me through his open window. At first, I thought he was a child because he was a very short and petite man. He was so sunken in his seat that I could barely see him, not to mention he had his cap pulled down just above his eyes. I remember that the cap had a logo on it. His skin was slightly sunburned too. He looked between 40 and 50 years old. He fully rolled his window down, leaned over the passenger seat and called out. Hi, I'm sorry to tell you, but your dad has been involved in an accident. He's been rushed to the hospital. I'm one of your dad's friends and I'm here to take you to see him in the hospital. Of course, when you hear something as terrible as that, it's going to shock you. But I had never met this old man before. When you're younger and an adult tells you to get in the car, you listen, right? 
I didn't know what to do. What was I supposed to do right now? My legs were frozen solid. At this point, one of my friends arrived. I began to tell her about what I had just heard from the old man in the car, but our conversation was interrupted. Hurry up, your dad is waiting for you, ordered the old man in the white car. My friend and I just said nothing. Your dad asked me to come and get you, he called. Those words upset me. I didn't know him, but I was so worried about my dad. I was only in the third year of elementary school. I was so confused and very wary of the situation. Something in my gut told me that this was very dangerous. This standoff between us and the old man in the car went on for about ten minutes until he said, Fine, don't get in. I hope your dad forgives you. He rolled up the window and started the car and drove off. I watched the car driving away. I had conflicting feelings of guilt for not accepting the ride with him to see my father in hospital, yet I strongly felt that it wasn't safe. After a while, my friend and I decided to head home as usual. I was nervous all the way home as we walked along the seafront. I got home and spoke to my mother about what had happened. She confirmed that the creepy old man was a liar. She reported this to the school and the police. She looked at me dead in the eyes and said, I am so glad you didn't get in that man's car. The next day at school, all the students were gathered and given a warning about that strange man and told what happened to me. The teacher explained that if you see an older man wearing a cap in a white car, and he tells you that a family member or friend has gotten into an accident and he will take you to the hospital. Do not believe him and get away from him as fast as possible. I found out at a later date that a child had gone missing not too far from our school and the child's whereabouts are unknown. It was said that the child had been tricked into getting into a stranger's car and the police were currently conducting an investigation I don't know how that case ended, but I do pray that the child was returned safely and the perpetrator was arrested. What would have happened to me if I had gotten into that car? I'm much older now, but I think about this often, and when I do, I always break out in goosebumps. I was out to eat with my boyfriend, and the place we were eating at has a live show right next door. We decided to listen outside to some of the bands playing once we were done eating. It was around 9pm at this time. Shortly after going outside, this girl comes up to me and starts talking to me about all kinds of things. She has bright red hair, many piercings and tattoos. The first thing she did was compliment what we were wearing. I wasn't wearing anything special. A plain pink dress with Crocs. She seemed very friendly and continued on a conversation with us. Mainly me, though. I figured it's because I have piercings and a tattoo. Maybe that's why. I also kind of chalked it up to her being drunk or just overly friendly. Eventually, she asked me a weird question that I didn't really understand and can't recall. Something along the lines of, What's your purpose here or something? I just remember not understanding what she was asking me and just telling her where I worked because it sounded like that's what she was asking me. She said she works at the strip club in the same town and to come dance. She went abruptly after her while texting on her phone and went over to this guy. My boyfriend and I went to leave. I thought nothing of it and we passed by them. After turning the corner, my boyfriend told me to check and see if we were being followed. I looked behind my shoulder and didn't see anybody. I walked a bit further and looked back again, and there was the guy. He was walking extremely quick and caught up pretty fast. He followed us all the way to my car, which, mind you, was at least a mile away, until we got in and locked the doors. He was just a couple of feet away from my car before he turned around. My boyfriend told me to start the car ASAP, and once we left, 
He told me when he passed by them, he had heard the girl say to the guy something along the lines of, she's a little nervous, but... And he had a bad vibe I was being sex trafficked, or they were going to try to pimp me out, maybe snatch me up. I'm not entirely sure. It wouldn't have been very hard for him to do. He was at least double my weight as I'm only a hundred pounds. He was following with a lot of speed. And I mean really, what could the motive have been? I'm sorry if this is just convoluted. I'm just a bit creeped out. This didn't happen to me, but it happened to a close friend of mine, and she told me that she wishes to stay anonymous, but I can tell you that she's in her 20s, and she's very attractive. I will tell this story as if it happened to me though, so you can hear it the way my friend told it. i had been working late at the office pretty much all week, which caused me to miss my regular bus home. Usually if I wasn't working late, then I would get off the train and then get the bus. But because I was working late, I had to get a taxi home all week. On the night that this experience took place, I got off the train and saw that there was only one other person waiting in line for a taxi at the usual spot. I was relieved because at least I wasn't going to be in for a long wait. Just as I was about to stand in line, a man came running down the station steps. He ran ahead of me and got in line. This both surprised and annoyed me. I couldn't really do anything about it. I should have rushed to get in line myself, I guess. I tried not to let it bother me. It would only be a short wait until I would be on my way home. I lined up behind the man. After waiting for about 15 minutes, a taxi turned up and picked up the first person waiting in line. A middle-aged woman. The metal shutters to the train station stairs behind me slammed closed. It was later than I thought. I wondered if the lights in the station would go out and all the staff would leave. I didn't want to be here alone. Well, I wasn't alone yet. The man who pushed in front was still waiting on his taxi. Moments later, a taxi pulled up and the man got in. Before he got in, I think we were waiting for another 20 minutes. This was a much longer wait than usual. And come to think of it, the first taxi that pulled up was black and the second one was black. Was it just the one taxi driver working? So I made sure I took a look at the driver's face. I waited there alone. It was a little unnerving. I hoped that a taxi would turn up soon. I didn't like being on my own in a dark area so late. Then finally, after about another 20 minutes or so, a black taxi pulled up. It was the same driver I saw earlier. I got in. I was tired of standing there and glad to sit down. I told the driver where I wanted to go and asked if he could drop me off at a certain location. Can you take me to the construction yard? I asked. The reason I asked for the construction yard was because it was really close to my apartment and drivers and delivery people can never seem to find where I live. The construction yard was well known, so I always asked to get dropped off there. With that, we pulled away into the night. It was a dark night, summer had gone, and autumn was here. The taxi driver then said, Sounds like hard work. Are you going there to work the night shift? I was a bit too tired to enter into a conversation with the driver, so I replied something simple like, Yeah, I guess. I'm always cautious when giving out personal information. He didn't need to know, so I kept it vague. We got closer to the construction yard, and I started to root around my bag to get the taxi fare. Do you really work at one of those office buildings by the construction yard? The driver asked me. What a nosy guy, I thought. No, I don't, I replied to him a little sharply. I didn't know what he was trying to get at. Why did it matter where I worked to him? As soon as I told him I didn't actually work there, and I wasn't going on the night shift, he changed. Instead of pulling over by the construction yard, he sped up and kept going straight. Hey, you can drop me off here, you're going past it, I said. I started to panic. I didn't know what to do. He didn't say a word, 
He just looked focused on the road ahead. Driver, here is fine. Let me out, I said. I could now hear the fear in my voice. It had a shaky quality to it. You got in my taxi on Tuesday night, didn't you? Yeah, I remember you, he said while glancing at me in his rearview mirror. He was showing no signs of stopping the taxi. I was really scared now, scared of where this was all heading or where we were going. I had taken a taxi every night that week, but what did it matter? Why was this guy so invested? I sat there frozen in the back seats of the taxi. I can still remember the song that was playing on the radio and the smell of the leather seats. I couldn't understand what was happening. We drove for another couple of minutes down a dark highway. The lack of light made things ten times worse. Up ahead, I saw the lights of a convenience store that I use regularly, and I can remember thinking vividly, will anyone find me when this taxi finally stops? I was scared of what the driver's intentions were and what he was capable of. I think at that point, I reached my limits. Silent tears began to roll down my cheeks. What next, I wondered. And then, to my absolute shock, we pulled into the convenience store's parking lot. As soon as we stopped, the driver turned around and spoke to me in a calm voice. I'm really sorry. If you want to make a complaint about me, you can. Here's my card and all my information. You can call my bosses and tell them my name. It's all on my card. He went on to explain that he was the driver who picked me up and dropped me off on Tuesday, and because of the location I wanted to be dropped off at, he remembered me. He said he wondered why someone would want to be dropped off at a construction yard at night. Then he said, You know that guy who was waiting in line ahead of you at the train station? Well, that guy also wanted to be dropped off by the construction yard. I remembered that guy, the one who pushed in front of me. The driver said that while he was taking him back to the construction yard, he made a couple of calls. He was saying stuff like, I'll be there soon, and I think it will be about another 20 minutes after I get there. I was thinking, well, so what? They have a night shift in the yard. I can sometimes hear work going on when I walk past it to get home. Why is my taxi driver not taking me where I want to go? I asked him if it could have been a coincidence and what he was trying to get at. And he replied, That guy didn't seem to be an employee. There were no cars or trucks in the parking lot, and there were no lights on in the office or in the yard. Then I saw a minivan parked just off to the side of the entrance. It had blacked out windows. There were about four people in there, and when my headlights landed on the windshield, they all ducked down as if they didn't want to be seen. So for that reason, I found those people and my passenger very suspicious. So I'm really sorry if I took things into my own hands, and if you want to report me for it to my bosses, then I'm fine with that. But I could never be fine with dropping you off there with those men in that van. I stared at the driver. It looked like he had tears in the corner of his eyes waiting to come out. I wondered if there was a reason why he understood the red flags. He was a young guy, and he was taking a big risk by doing what he did. It almost made sense, but I guessed that it still could have been a coincidence. Then I remembered something that made me shiver. While I was waiting in line, my mom called. She didn't like it when I worked so late, and she wanted to check in with me. I remember the words I said on the phone. Yeah. I'm about to get the taxi now. I'll get it to the construction yard. That man was in front of me at that point in the line. It began to make sense. Maybe the driver was right. It did seem like the guy in front of me was planning something. I haven't thought about it for years, and I'm so grateful to the taxi driver. Of course I didn't report him, by the way. He might have just saved me that night from those men and that blacked-out minivan. I don't want to even think of what their intentions might have been. It was a random day. My family and I had a trip planned out to go somewhere far from home. 
just to go to a place in the Philippines called Dehelian Bukidnon Park. While on the way, we used a GPS tracker to reach our destination. None of us were aware that the GPS may not be accurate. We followed the route. My uncle was driving the car. It was a fortune car, big enough to fit many people inside. We were going up a hill surrounded by tall trees, and it was sunset. I fell asleep for a while because I was exhausted from the long journey. I soon woke up to my mother's voice saying, Be careful, we're gonna fall off. I looked out the car window. We were on top of a hill. The sides of the road were so thin and tight. One wrong turn, and we would all come crashing down. My cousins and I were at the back of the car. We stayed quiet because we knew not to panic in situations like this. My mom was the only one panicking. As we went further, my uncle drove slowly, and thankfully we didn't fall off, and my uncle managed to find an area to make a U-turn. It was still on top of the hill, but this area was wide enough. After making it back to the main road safely, we were all shaken, scared. Hours of driving later, it was nighttime. There was nothing in sight. All there was, was a void of nothingness. My family didn't follow the GPS this time. They relied on memory because they've been on that road before. We were going uphill again. I have no idea where we were, but all I saw were trees around the car and the quiet sound of the car wheels driving over the gravel. Then, at some point, we stopped. I was confused, but it appeared that the road ended. Everyone in the car was quiet. My mother asked my uncle to check outside. When he opened the car door, it was so cold. The wind was strong and I heard the trees rustling. It was really spooky and it sent a chill down my spine. My uncle closed the car door and as he turned on the car lights, there was a line of people, many of them. I have no idea what they were doing in the woods at night. It was so weird. After that, I fell asleep from exhaustion. I hadn't had anything to eat all day because we were stranded in the woods. The next thing, I woke up and we were already on the main road, and we stopped by a 7-Eleven shop, and my mom and uncle bought hot dogs for my cousins and I to eat. All of us were starving and had no energy. I'm glad my family and I were safe. Just a reminder, if you want to go somewhere, you can't always trust the GPS or the maps because some routes might be outdated. Before I got my car in my freshman year of college, I would use Lyft to get to work pretty much every day during the summer. During winter and fall, I just walked, even at night. And in all those Lyft cars and drivers, I've never had any noticeable encounters. I've probably been in a couple hundred by now, and aside from the occasional political opinion and speeder, it was all fine. One day I order a Lyft car like normal. It'll be here in seven minutes. Cool. I walk outside a couple minutes early to go and wait for my driver, and I see a vehicle that pretty much matches the description of mine sitting in my driveway. It was the same color, the same size, and unless you noticed the little details, it pretty much looked the same. But my driver was still two minutes away. I chose to ignore him, thinking it's just a funny coincidence and maybe he's a friend of a neighbor or something. But then he rolls down his window and looks at me. So I go up to talk to him. Maybe he's just lost. And by the way, he's a different race entirely from my actual driver. So I know for sure that this isn't him. But they are similar skin tones and age. He tells me that he's my driver and pulls out his phone that has my profile, like how your driver has to make sure it's you. So in my naive and innocent teenage mind, I think to myself, Oh, Lyft must have accidentally sent me two drivers. And I tell him that he's not the driver I was told I would meet. Right as we're talking, my actual driver pulled up and rolled his window down. 
I explained the situation and said I'll probably get in the first guy's car because he was here first. Then the second driver says that I should probably go with whoever's on my phone. That sounded pretty logical to me and made sense, but before I could turn around and tell the other guy I was going to go ahead and pick the other one, he drove off. I then noticed that his car had tinted windows. It wasn't until I got into the car that my driver brought it to my attention how fucking weird that was. He told me in his 10 years of being a Lyft driver, nothing like that has ever happened to him or anyone he knew. Then it suddenly dawned on me about what might have just happened. The similar car appearance to my actual driver, the fact that he had my information but I didn't have his, the fact that he was there a couple minutes early, so if I did get in, it wouldn't have intercepted my real driver, everything and I almost got into his car. I went to work, and I was totally shaken up. I tried making a report to Lyft, but without any evidence or information, other than a basic physical description, there wasn't much I could do. My Lyft driver said he would go ahead and tell the story to some other driver friends on a social media forum, so they could all spread the word. That does make me feel a bit better. That driver might have saved my life. I think about that a lot. And hey, my dad heard about it and got me a car, so at least I got something other than trauma. I've also told a couple of people in real life due to the traumatic and scary nature of the whole thing. Looking back on it now, it was most likely a trafficker or kidnapper. These guys probably have access to lift servers, and they look for repeating customers just like me. I've since deleted the app and my account. Always check the license plates. I worked EMS while my friend was dispatched for this call. I was second, so I never got to interact with the person in question, but I did listen to the 911 recording after. There was a call to do backup for a gunshot wound initially, a farm about 20 to 30 minutes outside of town. It turned out to be a father who recently lost both of his parents within the month, and he didn't want his family to go through with such loss either. He decided to kill his family to spare them that same fate. The father killed the mom and two kids. We get a call from the daughter, who's about 13. She's been shot in the head, but is still alive and conscious. The call was about 30 minutes long, but the father was in the same room as her and the rest of the recently murdered family members. She was sitting on her bed with a bullet in her head, just saying in the most monotone voice, I've been shot. My family is dead. My dad has a gun. Just in so much shock that she couldn't express an emotion. You could hear long pauses of silence as the dispatcher tried to get an idea of the situation and how the daughter and dad were just staring each other down for five minutes at a time with nothing but breathing to be heard and the daughter answering the dispatcher's questions. About 30 minutes go by of the dispatcher saying, are you all right? Is he still there? Does he still have the gun? and other questions, and there were just monotone responses. You can hear the sound of sirens in the background, and the father leaves the room followed by a gunshot. The dad shot himself and died right as we were pulling up. She ended up living, but had lost every single member of her family that week. I don't know what happened after all that. That call is the reason I never wanted to pursue dispatch ever again. My friend was an absolute champ for how he handled it, but he never wanted to listen to it again. To start this off, I need to give some context. I'm 23 and I currently live in New York City but I have grandparents who live down in rural West Virginia. When I say rural, I mean the literal boonies. 
Their closest neighbors are over an hour away in a small town with a few houses and a Walmart. Last summer, my grandfather, Robert, had surgery done on his hip. The majority of my family lives on the west coast, and my grandmother, Muriel, is very old and wouldn't have been able to take care of Robert. Because I was the closest family member, I agreed to come down there for two weeks while he recovered from his surgery. Fast forward a week. Everything was going fine. All I really had to do was help my grandfather up and down the stairs and walk his dog, a blue healer named Rocky. Normally, my grandfather would walk Rocky once in the morning and once at night through the woods behind their property, but because of his surgery, that responsibility fell onto me. This was the part that I hated about helping him, because ever since I was a kid, I never liked those woods behind the property. Whenever I'd go down there as a kid, my cousins and I would always get creeped out going into that forest. It always just felt off for some reason. Anyways, for the first week, walking Rocky in the forest at night was fine, even if a bit creepy. That was until one night, a week into my stay, I was walking him through the forest. It was around 8.30, and the sun was setting over the Appalachian Mountains. Everything was going normal, until I heard a strange whistle that sounded like it was only around 20 yards away. Both the dog and I stopped dead in our tracks, and we looked towards the direction the whistling came from. I shined my flashlight in the direction, but I didn't see anything, so I just assumed it was a bird. Looking back, it definitely wasn't a bird. There's no nocturnal birds that chirp and whistle out there and it sounded more musical than anything a bird could whistle. But the dog was spooked. He wouldn't stop growling and staring at whatever was back there, and he kept trying to back up until whatever, or whoever this thing was, whistled again, to which the dog started barking and going crazy. At this point, I decided that I definitely didn't want to stay there, so I yanked on the dog's leash and we both bolted out of the woods and straight back home. When we got back, I told my grandparents what happened. They both seemed spooked, and my grandmother immediately asked if I whistled back. I told her that I didn't, and she seemed relieved, but she told me that I didn't hear anything and to just ignore it. I asked why, and she wouldn't tell me, and would instead just tell me that I didn't hear anything. I decided not to press on it any further and went to bed, terrified and wondering what she seemed so freaked out about. The next morning, she told me that instead of walking Rocky through the woods, I could just take him on laps around the house, so that's what I started doing. Every night, I would take Rocky for about 50 laps around the house before going back inside. On Friday, the third to last day I would be there, at night, I was taking the dog for laps as usual until I heard that same creepy whistle behind the attached garage, which was only around 10 yards from the house. This time, I immediately took the dog back inside and locked the doors. The rest of the night, I put my earbuds in and I ignored any more whistling like my grandmother told me to. To this day, I still don't know what was whistling in those woods. Some of my friends say it was a skinwalker, but that's a Navajo thing, and there's almost no Navajo in West Virginia. My girlfriend, who stayed back in New York, asked her Muslim parents who are from Yemen, and they said whistling at night is a sign that a jinn is nearby. I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, had my grandparents legitimately scared. I've heard of weird shit happening in Appalachia, but this is the first time that I've ever had a first-hand experience with it. Does anyone have any idea what this could have been? Back when I was a kid, my family and I lived in a pretty old house in Tennessee. The house was built in the 1920s, I believe. The house was kind of shaped in a square, 
think of a racetrack that you can go around. Anyways, my sister and I's bedroom door was in the living room and the hallway was to the left. I used to have reoccurring nightmares and sleep paralysis of a tall man with a hat coming down the hallway to my bedroom door and I would always wake up before he came into my room. Textbook sleep paralysis story. During summer, my mom would leave me and my three siblings home alone while she worked. She would come home tired, and since she low-key had a lot of kids, she didn't like us to stampede her when she arrived home. So anyways, one day we were all chilling in the living room, watching TV while our mom was at work, just doing the usual. We heard our mom get home from work early that day, and we were happy as fuck. We heard the back door open, and she came in talking to her friend on her Bluetooth. She always wore these black leather boots, and we heard them clunking on the floor while she walked and talked toward us. When she was finally almost to the living room, she was at the end of the hallway where I told you guys earlier where I used to see the shadow man in my dream. Guess what? When we got up to greet her in that spot, she wasn't there. We were all stunned. My sister called her, and you guessed it, she was still at work. I didn't tell my brother about the shadow man before, but when I did, he said he saw him too in the bathroom, which was in that same hallway. My mom said she used to hear my little brother calling her name when he wasn't home. I hated that house. This took place about four years ago. I was driving from my grandma's house, which is about an hour from my work. It's a pretty straight shot of the interstate, and while I usually took the back roads, it was getting kind of rainy, and I just wanted to go ahead and get there and get home. My car at the time was a beater station wagon that had a tendency to sort of overheat, but not really. It would just kind of stop working. This was usually when the gas tank was getting on the low side, but it wouldn't actually be out of gas. Usually, if I let it sit for a few minutes, it'd be fine. Anyhow, I'm heading to my grandma's when the car starts its overheating slash acting routine. I pulled over to the shoulder and cut the car off. I wait about five minutes, just sitting there smoking a cigarette. I go to start it up, and nothing. It wouldn't actually turn over. As the daughter of a well-versed car guy, I popped the hood. Not that I would actually be able to recognize exactly what was wrong, but I knew enough to at least rule some things out. I didn't notice anything major malfunctioning, so I start to make my game plan. At this point, I'm still about 40 minutes away from my destination. My dad is a good hour and a half from me, and I know if I go that route, there's bound to be a lecture I don't want so I decide to call the roadside assistance number in my state. The dispatcher is very nice, lets me know that a tech should be there in about 30 minutes, so I start to settle in my car to wait while the rain sprinkles outside. After about 15 minutes or so, a car pulls up in front of me. It's not the DOT guy, it's a stranger in a beat-up 80s Monte Carlo. He starts to walk to my car. Just so you know, I live in the south, it's not out of character for someone to stop and help you. Anyhow, I watch as the man approaches. He's six foot three or so, and built like he might work in manual labor. I roll the window down about three inches, because it's raining and I don't know this person. He gets close to the window and asks if I need help. I thank him immediately, but let him know that no, I'm good, and I'm waiting for the DOT guy to show up. He says, I work on cars, want me to take a look and see if it's a loose wire or something. I thought it was a nice offer, because I'm a little too trusting, and I say sure. I pop the hood again and get out of the car to look with him. I know, stupid decision, but again, I'm pretty trusting. He fumbles around a little with various wires that are perfectly fine making small talk about how he was coming from a local army base from visiting his daughter and heading back to his home that's in a neighboring state and whatever else. I found it a bit odd, 
I mean, it could have been legit, but he was wearing really dusty and dirty clothes, jeans with huge holes in the knees, and he just didn't look clean. Not that you would go to the base in your Sunday clothes, but chances are you would have showered. So then he starts saying, well, it doesn't look like your roadside assistance is coming. He said it almost accusingly, as if I had never called them and made that up when he first got to my car. Still being doe-eyed, I said, actually, he should be here any minute. That's when it got weird and my spidey sense finally started tingling. The rain is getting a little heavier by the minute. He looks at me, well, mostly at my chest, and his energy, for lack of a better term, changes, and he offers to take me to the McDonald's off the next exit for a cup of coffee to get out of the rain. I thanked him for the offer, but said no thanks. He said, it's right up there, pointing about a quarter of a mile up the road. We'd be able to see the dot guy. I thanked him again, and again declined, saying I'd be fine in my car, no biggie. He started to get more and more aggressive in his offer, saying things like, Come on, it's right there, one cup, my treat, and my daughter's a soldier. I wouldn't try anything weird on you. Just hop in the car and we'll go right there. Each time he says something, he moves a bit closer to me. The little voice in your head that goes off kept saying, Keep acting dumb. Keep acting polite. Keep refusing. Get in your car and lock the door, you colossal moron. Finally, when I told him that I really appreciated his offer, but since I didn't know him from Adam, I just wasn't comfortable doing that. But how incredibly kind it was for him to stop and be so helpful, and that I really hoped he had a great day. He finally relented. I had been edging my way to my door as the rain hit its crescendo. Once in the safety of my car, I locked all the doors and watched him walk back to his car and drive away. Not five minutes later, the dot tech arrives. He comes up to my passenger side window as the rain has pretty much returned to a light drizzle. I get out and tell him the story of the man and what transpired. He gets this horrified look on his face and says, You do realize you would never have been heard from again if you had gotten into that car. I explained that when the guy kept being pushy about it, the alarm bells finally sounded, and all I could think to do was continue to be polite but firm so that he didn't get offended or angry and snap and do God only knows what. He told me I should have never gotten out of the car, and I should immediately thank my guardian angel. I'm pretty certain I was a frog's hair from being found in a garbage bag. I am no longer a skeptic. My wife and I stayed at an Airbnb that was a house built in 1901 in an old mining town in Arizona. The experiences we had made us leave a day early at 3.30 a.m. The town is called Bisbee, Arizona. It's a small town tucked into the mountains near the Mexican border, less than 20 miles away from the famed town of Tombstone. I'll give a brief history, but if you ever want to fall down an internet rabbit hole, the town's full history is pretty fascinating. Copper and other valuable minerals were discovered there in 1877, and a mining camp sprung up. The population swelled significantly over the next couple of decades, and at one point, the population was bigger than San Francisco. The problem was that they crammed this population into what is effectively a canyon. The town is literally built into the sides of the canyon, with front door steps leading to your neighbor's roof in the lot below. With the population surge came crime, disease, sanitation issues, and whatever else, not to mention the toxic fumes and smoke that came with the mining operations. People were making money hand over fist while living in absolute squalor and misery for quite some time. They mined there continuously until 1974, and dug one of the largest open pit mines in America. 
When the copper ran out, the mining company up and left and basically sold the whole town back to the townspeople and they turned it into a fun, artsy, hippie party town. Some world-renowned artists lived there, including comedian Doug Stanhope. This year was the third year in a row my wife and I had gone down there for the 4th of July. The trip had become sort of a tradition. This year we stayed at an Airbnb that was a house built in 1901. It was actually one of the first houses built on the main street through town. I'd like to preface that overall, I've always been a skeptic when it comes to the paranormal. I've always found it entertaining, but felt that ultimately it was probably bullshit. My wife also felt the same way. It would take a very concrete experience for me to fully believe. Well, let me tell you about my experiences over the past couple of days and nights that changed my outlook quite a bit. So, the first evening we were there, we were just kind of milling about, deciding what we were going to do for the evening. I was in the kitchen, and I distinctly heard footsteps on the hardwood floors. I absolutely thought my wife was walking up behind me, and even felt the presence of someone there. I turned around, and there was no one there. She was laying in bed on her phone. We chalked it up to leftover thunder from a storm that had just passed, or maybe even old plumbing. Later that night, when we were getting into bed, we were plugging our phones in and testing out light switches and such. I switched my light on, and we both heard a weird scratching sound on or in the wall. I even jokingly said, Damn, I hope that's not wires arcing in the walls or something. It definitely wasn't wires arcing, as I am familiar with that sound, but the sound was definitely along the same lines. The next morning at breakfast, my wife mentions that she had trouble sleeping because of very vivid and intense nightmares that took place in the house. She said they were those types of dreams where you're not sure if you're awake or asleep. It was enough to visibly shake her, and she's by no means an easily shaken woman. The next night rolls around, and we go to bed at around 10 p.m. or so. I drifted off to sleep for what felt like maybe 30 minutes or so before I was woken up by multiple itchy slash ticklish feelings all over my body. At first I chalked it up to my sensitive skin against the sheets I'm not used to. I've had that happen before, but this time it was different. Every time I would scratch the spot where I had the feeling, it would instantly move to another part of my body. It felt like someone was intentionally trying to aggravate me. I also had slept in the same bed a few times before this with no issue. Dealing with this made me toss and turn for a couple of hours until I finally had it and got up to find my wife awake as well. She was having the same nightmare as the night before and she couldn't sleep. She also had a deep uneasiness about the mirrors hung around the house. Now that we were awake, she went out on the porch to have a smoke and I stayed in bed scrolling through my phone and while I was doing this, I saw a person walk across the foot of my bed out of the corner of my eye. I also felt the presence of someone walking in. The airflow from the AC even changed slightly. It was vivid enough that I 110% thought it was my wife walking in and my stomach sank like a rock when I realized she was still out on the porch. I thought it might have been a glare from my phone, but I tried every which way to recreate it, and I was unable to. Both of us being unable to sleep, we started talking about stuff. Now, mind you, we rarely, if ever, argue or fight, and we definitely don't get angry and things don't get heated, especially over topics like the ones we were discussing. As the conversation went on, this weird negative energy started to develop and the conversation started turning south. We both kind of snapped out of it, thought about the events leading up to this, and decided to pack up and nope the fuck out of there. As we were leaving, my wife went back in to grab one last thing and heard multiple footsteps around her 
and had the distinct feeling she was being chased out. We drove back to Tucson in the dead of night and are both still sitting here, still in a state of shock about what we experienced. This happened August 2013. I was camping in far north Queensland, Australia, in a place called Barron Falls, which is northwest of Cairns. I, a 21-year-old girl, was camping with two male friends who were backpacking from Estonia, Theo and Charlie. Where we set up camp was not an official campsite. Rather, we walked along the tourist path, climbed over a railing, followed a train track for a few kilometers, and eventually veered off into the dense forest, downhill to the river. It certainly wasn't easy to get to this area, and there wasn't any mobile phone service, but Theo knew about it from friends who had shown him previously. This site was beautiful. We were surrounded by a tropical forest, and were only a short walk upstream from the waterfall. After setting up camp, we walked to the waterfall, where both Theo and Charlie plunged from the cliff into the water below. I decided not to follow. I was, and still am, scared of heights and the possibility of hurting myself. I sat and watched them for a while, before eventually deciding to return to camp and read my book. I was totally relaxed, enjoying the serenity, taking in the beauty around me. What had been an exciting, adventurous day was then interrupted by a deep, sinister laughter coming from the forest surrounding our campsite. Instantly alerted, I felt chills run through my body as I scanned the forest, trying to detect where the laughter had come from. There was nothing. I tried to forget about it, convincing myself that my mind was playing tricks on me. Theo and Charlie returned and told me that they'd forgotten fire lighters for the campfire. They said that they'd need to travel to the nearest store to buy some and that I should wait at camp. I told them that I didn't feel comfortable staying at camp, but I didn't mention the laughter I'd heard before. I didn't want them to think I was stupid, and for context, at the time, I had quite a large crush on Charlie. Stupidly, I wanted him to think I was cool. They told me it will be fine, that they would be back before dark. Reluctantly, I agreed and let them go. It was about 4 p.m., and I continued reading my book. I began to think about it, and I realized that the walk back to the car was about 20 to 30 minutes, so they would be gone for well over an hour. At this time of year, dusk would be at 5.30 p.m. or so, and I would therefore likely be alone in this remote area in the dark. I distracted myself with my book, but as dusk began to settle, I struggled to read the pages and fear began to set in. After about an hour, I started to hear footsteps in the forest. My first thought was that Theo and Charlie had returned, and I was instantly relieved that I was no longer alone. I listened for their voices, but heard nothing. My heart dropped. It dawned on me that it may not be them, and I started to panic. The same deep sinister laughter I'd heard before, only this time it seemed much closer. I sprung to my feet and surveyed the forest. Then I saw him. He was standing on the other side of a stream which was connected to the river. Standing on a log, what I saw was absolutely bizarre. He was wearing an immaculate tuxedo with a top hat and all. I remember being puzzled as to how he was able to get to this area in such clean, formal clothes, and I at first thought he may be an apparition or that I was hallucinating. I did a double take, and I was not. I then studied the man's face. It's hard to describe, but he appeared to have suffered from severe burns and had deep scarring covering his face. His hair was shoulder-length, very wiry and unkept. He laughed, that same laugh I'd heard from the forest. It came from him. 
we stared at each other for what felt like minutes. I had planned to sprint into the forest if he charged at me, and observed that the small creek between us would at least slow him down. He then asked, What are you doing here, all alone? With an unsettling smile on his face. Luckily, I was able to remain calm and told him that I was camping with my male friends and that they went to get some supplies, but will be back soon. The man laughed again. He asked me how long we would be there for. I lied and said we were leaving the next day. It seemed as if this man wanted to provoke a reaction out of me, that he wanted me to panic and run, and that he wanted to chase me. I remained calm and acted as if we were having a standard conversation. I think this confused him. Miraculously, I heard Theo and Charlie's voices approaching. The man seemed alarmed and said that he saw somebody else camping upstream and that he's going to check on them. He left, and minutes later, Theo and Charlie returned. I immediately told them what happened, and they left and thought I was making it up, that it was a lame attempt to scare them. Tears began to gather in my eyes, and Charlie realized that I was serious. Theo didn't seem phased. He was a very stereotypical backpacker and had the carefree nature travelers tend to have. Charlie, however assured me that I would be okay, and had me sleep between him and Theo for the next two nights. I barely slept at all for those nights. I kept listening for the laughter, but fortunately never heard it again. For years after, I searched online for any reports of similar encounters. I never found anything, but I have always contemplated what would have happened if Theo and Charlie hadn't returned at that moment. I shudder at the thought. I would love to hear what you guys think this man's intentions were, and if I was right to be terrified. I haven't been camping since. This is truly the scariest, most horrible thing that has ever happened to me. I've never been so petrified in my life. To this day, I still don't know who this man was, what he was trying to do, or if he's still where I saw him. I'm sorry for how long the geographical description is. I just want everyone to understand how secluded I was when this happened, and how badly it could have ended if it wasn't for my parents. I was back home for the summer for the first time in a year after starting university. Our home was, and still is, just outside of a small town with forests all around. There was also a small man-made lake which was diverged from a river that ran for miles through the forest and ramified into a few streams east of the lake. Near my home, there was a small grassy path that led to the river following a stream. It was a long walk but one I used to go on often as a child. I knew the forests there well. I knew where I could cut through dense trees to meet the stream. The walk I would go on always led me off the path, which turned northwest slowly, so away from the stream, and then took a sharp turn to the west after a few miles walk, at which point the stream was hidden quite deep into the forest. I'd continue to walk north and follow the stream through the forest to get to the river, then follow the river west to get to the lake. It's easy to get lost in the forest, because the terrain isn't just a slope down to the water. It goes up and down, and you end up completely surrounded by trees. I'd spent many days wandering around there alone, or with my dad over the span of 18 years. I never saw anybody else in the forest. I went there twice that summer, both times alone-ish. The first time I left in the morning, I walked along the path away from the stream to the sharp bend, then cut back into the forest. I reached the stream after an hour or so. As I was running my hands in the water, I heard a bell from far away coming from the north. Something was making a bell ring fervently and periodically, which I found strange. I listened well, 
wondered if it was a lost hunting dog and started moving towards the sound. Yeah, I bloody know I'd be the first person to die, but I was heading north anyway, so what the hell. I realized it couldn't have been an animal. I could tell the bell was too heavy because of how clear the sound was to be on a collar. I kept moving, and the bell was moving away from me. It stopped completely after five minutes. The stream wasn't big enough or strong enough to carry a bell that could have been enclosed in a tin or something, and the river was too far still. I thought of everything, but nothing explained the sound apart from one obvious thing which I just didn't feel comfortable with for some reason. I knew it had to have been a person. I stopped thinking about it and just walked on normally. That is until I found a badger, a dead one, carefully decapitated. It had obviously been done with a knife. It was fairly fresh. The body was still limp and there wasn't too much smell coming from it. The wound was full of maggots, but I knew that happened soon after exposure. The sound of the bell had been following the stream. So had I. So, the badger was put there, maybe killed there, at least decapitated while I was walking that way, I suppose. I'm not completely sure. Nothing else happened that day. One week later, I went back for the second time that summer and the last time ever. I left home around 6 p.m. I made it to the stream, then walked to the river in an hour. Then I decided to go back the way I came because it was getting late and it was raining quite heavily. The sun set at around 9 p.m. I was walking as fast as I could. The sound of the rain in the trees was surreal and loud. I was somewhat trotting with my head down for a while through the clearest and most open part of the forest when I bumped into something heavy. The smell was sickly. It was the decomposing body of the badger with his head strung to his front paws. That area looked a bit like ham because of the way it was tied, just swinging from a tree like an almost literal load of bollocks. It was this putrid bag of stench wet and dripping green liquid. I started gagging. I had some sort of mucus textured fluid in my hair. It was repulsive. At first, I just stared at it, slightly gobsmacked. Then I started fidgeting violently because I felt like I was drenched in its juices. I was soaking from the rain. My senses became confused. It felt like a bucket of ice cold water had been thrown over me when I realized that I walked the same way to get to the river, so someone had strung up the body after I'd passed it on the way there. Someone knew I'd seen it. So, was someone watching me and running around the forest? Were the faint sounds of branches breaking around me not animals? I looked around and started jogging. I was half running, half walking away from the stream, back towards the path for a while, when I heard the bell again, I proceeded to call my dad while running. I told him where to meet me on the path where it sharply turns west. It was the closest part of the path to me, to go as fast as he could, and that someone was in the forest. I can't explain the feeling I had. It was like I had just shit out my intestines and stomach. I literally felt the hairs on my neck raise despite being soaked. It was dark. I jogged as fast as I could. I was panicking because the path was still a bit far away. It was just too far to feel safe. It was still raining. Every single sound was muffled. I felt like everything was further away than ever before. The bell went on for way longer than the last time. On and off. I felt like it was surrounding me at one point. The fear, combined with my compromised hearing, and the fact that I couldn't fucking breathe properly was making me slightly lose my sense of direction. I was automatically heading southwest, but I wasn't really sure what I was even doing. I was breathing like a horse, coughing my lungs up, kind of crying out loud like a toddler does, tripping over leaves and twigs like an idiot. I stayed on the phone with my mom 
who was on her way with my dad. I kept hearing sounds, but I wasn't sure what they were. My mom was screaming on the phone at the same time that they were on the path that I needed to run. That my dad had gotten out and was heading east from the path bend. I was terrified, so I went into survival mode. I was doing the half running, half speed walking thing again because I was out of breath. Then I heard branches break. Clear footsteps for the first time from down in the forest and the bell ringing louder. I didn't want to, but I looked over my shoulder. That's when I saw what was in the forest with me. A tall figure creeping in my direction at the very end of the clearing, ringing this bell slowly in front of his stomach. I could tell he was staring straight at me. Now, I don't know if I had a hidden secret sprinting ability or instinctual adrenaline-induced superhuman powers, but when I tell you I ran for my life, I fucking didn't look back once. I screamed as much as I could. I lied. I'm on the phone with the police. They're on the path. Dad, I can see you. I'm here. I wanted to yell, Dad, please, where are you? But I kept that to myself. I felt like something awful was going to happen. I felt like this man was right behind me. I kept telling myself not to look back. I was gasping and wheezing, crying so hard and screaming for my dad. I felt shivers on my neck and then switched off. I just ran. I even dropped my bag and only realized I didn't have it anymore when I was in the car. I felt like my phone was my only way home. Things no longer felt real. It was like my legs were moving by themselves. I didn't know if the man was still following me. I could only hear my heart beating in my ears and the bell. I finally heard my dad shout my name and I knew he was coming my way and that he could see me because of the intonation of his voice. I pretty much lunged myself at him when we got to each other. My dad heard the bell too. My mom could hear it on the phone. She was waiting with the car, ready to leave, fast. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email or post it to my subreddit. You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. Maureen Baumgartner Tyson Allen Tyler Wilson Alexandria Bannock It's me, Ryan Trevor Blockley, Cassandra Bricker Wyatt, Paddy's niece, Adiara Yasharala L, Deb Foster, Kathleen Greer, Lynn Meese, Ryan, Chris Lawson, Joe Jordan, Lise Mendoza, Brooke, Nikki Bundrant, Thomas Doolittle, The Tijara, Brooke, Nikki Bundrant, Thomas Doolittle, Jennifer Chamberlain, Denise Watson, Zero Bite. Erica Asir, Forgotten Ruins TV, Night Shadow, Healing with Ev, Talisha Kluss, Donna Cox, Holy Crusader, Sheila Grant 44, Julie Hibbins, Stephanie McLaren, Janet Mills Rice, Bob Jeff, Master Dom Howie, Denise Watson, Roz, Cassandra Wyatt, Travis Smith, Zoe D, Kat Philbin, Melissa Friesen, Lorna Clark, Kathy Richmond, Natasha Hensley, Jaleesa Ferguson, Leah McBride, Emily Pearson, Tyler Wilson, Lynn Meese, Kristen Birdall, Shaz, Betty Brantley, Candice Lee, Africa Winfield, Becca, Lydia Adams, Girl Veteran, Legends CBZ 69 2012, Katrina King, 
Hospital Cakewalk, Dirty Diana, Quinta Siegel, Shirley Porch, Taylor Ruiz, Annalisa Petrie, Jasmine Davis, Janelle Jensen, Jasper Roth, Alex, Monica Levelace, James Gargano, Sarah P, Fire 05, Matt is a Felter, Tierra Sanders, Melissa Kingery, Kitty Cat Luna 2, Chelsea Moffat, Ryan, Gabrielle, Jenny, Sarah, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Sam, Amanda Jane, Vampy Debs, October Gypsy, Rebecca, Erica B, Maribel De Luna, Lloyd Rash, Jennifer Jenkins, Kelly Townsend, Mary Wright, Tara Harris, Elizabeth Knapp, Eddie, Sean Gorman, Sue Gordon, Spider's Web, Kay, Christy, Absinthe Alice, Dina Kingery, Snowball Rathena, Lady Drackard, Brenda, Pretty Girl 215, Amber Davis, Sigma Cube X, Leticia Acklin, Ali O'Neill, Gina Eberhardt, Lilypad, Ashley Nicole, Sarah Chifalo, May 2nd, 2003, Bella Plays, 2006, Skin Crawler, Stephanie McLaren, Borderline Betty, Kuro, Top Off, Kelly Ann Bain, Michael O'Malley, Neil Kavanagh, The Dead Movie Society, Diana Johnston, Taya Adwell, Danielle, Possum Posse, Crafty Kell, Brooke, Scott McKenzie, Megan Abrams, Jane Wiggins, Jasmine Davis, Jack White, Your Pappy's Dilly, Emma Lisa, Tanya Ferguson, The Wendy, Ember Hops, Alexia Tuttle, Ram Beltran, Elizabeth Mayers, Unladylike 13, Pegasus Genesis, Sheila Grant 44, Sona, Scout Mom 405, Cheryl Duckworth, Ashley Bray, Angela Reeves, Kim Thompson, Brock Bollard, Nick Bigdowski, Jessica Lasley, Yennefer, Clary Scott, Timothy Stratton, Melissa Kingery, Shane Stevens, Serge Vargas, Bart in Real Life, April Jordanet, Lisa Prentice, Mason Hayes, Sarah Price, Jasmine Thomas, Angie Lindon, Z Harris, Kirby Harris, Yolo Sapien, Lavina Cordelia, Misty Racour, Michelle Green, Dixie Busby, Paula Ferreira Nieves, Samantha Place, Donna Cox, Stephen Wheeler, Melissa Moore, Deshaun Edmondson, This Bad Kitty, Gloria, Christina Myway, Connie Sue, Carol Zaffirano, Merciful Humming, Kelsa Rundle, Ashley Juster, Vicky Howell, Joe Tozer, Zoe D, Nicholas Johnson, Kimmy Love. Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.